Hello. Welcome to my channel Touching Stories. You're about to hear an amazing story about love and unexpected decisions. Enjoy watching. Well, whispered Mike, a hardened thief and con man. Pete didn't answer. He was working on the locks, and in the judge's house, they're complicated, fancy, expensive, protected against everything, sawing, ripping, breaking, automatic locking in case of attempted unauthorized access. In general, with all the tricks that marketers invented for rich people to feel safe. Bingo, Pete whispered, opening the last mechanism. He pulled the handle slowly, carefully, and the door opened. Although the house was dark and the hallway was lit only by the moon, the luxury was noticeable even in the semi-darkness. Wood-paneled floors and walls, huge mirrors, expensive furniture, bronze and plaster figures. A wide staircase to the second floor, handrails decorated with balusters, moldings on the ceiling, a glass chandelier, and other attributes of success and prosperity. Mike felt the pleasant tingle that always came to him on the case. It was as if he were going through shells on the seashore, and in one of them, he suddenly discovered a huge pearl. Joy, the anticipation of profit filled his black soul, but there was another feeling too the sweet revenge he was about to exact. Pete and Mike stopped, listening. Was the alarm going off? Was the owner preparing to meet them with a shotgun? And wasn't there a huge dog that could chew their asses off? No, everything was quiet and peaceful. The expensive appliances didn't make any noise. It was November, so the air conditioners were off, too. Mike pointed to the stairs, and they pulled out their volleys. That's what the thugs called all kinds of firearms, whether they were pistols, sawed-off shotguns, or small rifles. They took what they could get, Mike an old colt, and Pete a fresh Glock, which he had been lucky enough to get from an acquaintance. Mike led the way. It's only in the movies that the leader leads his gang. In the real world, the leader prefers to hide behind the backs of the fighters. There was only one, but it was better than nothing. Yeah, people live, Pete thought, pacing the second floor. They knew how to live. It won't be long now. There were pictures on the walls, gauges, shelves of awards from the judge, his wife, and their daughters. Pete wanted to turn on the light to get a better look at all this good stuff. Something he could take away as a souvenir. No, I don't think so. It's all about the cash. I don't think that man in the row trusts banks. He must keep all his money, earned by honest and dishonest labor, in a safe. Yes, the cleaning lady had told him everything and even took pictures, so he already had a detailed floor plan in his head. Where the judge's bedroom was in the house, where the safe was, and that there would be no strangers in the house today, November 11th. Herbert had sent his family to a sale in the city, rented a hotel for a few days, but he stayed in the cottage to get away from his annoying wife and melancholy daughter. Perhaps he read cases on weekends or wrote new sentences. Too bad the girl won't be here, Mike thought. I'd be with her. Ah, he had no luck with women. He'd gotten his first sentence at 16 as a kid, if you ask me. And since then, in between sentences, he hadn't had time to meet enough normal girls to have a healthy relationship. Or they avoided him. Mike's lot in life were corrupt women who came into his life easily and left it just as quickly. Pete pointed the barrel at a large mahogany door. Mike turned the knob slowly with his left hand, listened, asleep, judge, feeling safe. Behind all the expensive locks and electronic gadgets, pulled the door open. Everything else went according to plan. Pete jumped abruptly into the room and flicked on the light. The light switch, Barbara said in her annoying voice, is to the right of the entrance. Mike ran up to the judge and struck him on the forehead with the handle of his pistol. Herbert had by now opened his eyes from behind the light, but was immediately plunged into darkness. He had not even had time to realize what had happened. Just now he had been watching his dark judicial dreams, and here it was as if they had come true. Stunned, he could hear his tormentors talking but he couldn't tell if he was dreaming or real. 
There's the safe. Mike chuckled. Look at that. Yeah, Pete exhaled. It's easy to open one of these. Is there any hot food? Mike asked. I want to wet my throat, but I can't. I'll wet your throat. Pete threatened him. He didn't drink much alcohol himself and couldn't stand it if someone started drinking alcohol on the job. All right, all right, boss. I was just asking. It's a special day after all. I could use a drink. The robbers covered the windows. Two of them lifted the judge up, put him in a chair, tied his hands and feet. Pete looked closely at the face of the justice of the peace. Not young already wrinkles, gray hair. In the court session, he looked formidable and even convincing. And he seemed 10 centimeters taller. Silk pajamas, half, Pete thought. A real man should sleep in his mother's clothes, next to some hottie. The thug calculated the force of the blow precisely. He called it a cleaver. It should hit the parietal region from above, without much fanaticism. The lights would go out for about 20 minutes. He struck carefully, almost jewel-like. After all, the judge should live at least a little longer for an hour or two, until they get bored. Slowly, leisurely, they began to look through the rooms. Anything of value was brought into the judge's bedroom and left on the bed. Rolex watches, men's and women's. A gold chain of 30 centimeters, no less. Cash, pennies, two or three thousand dollars, but it's okay. The statuette was not cheap. Mike had brought it. Pete took it and put it on the shelf. It's notable, he explained. Let's have another look. In the judge's office and at the judge's home, he saw her black pen. There was a rumor about her in prison. Hera's is the only one who signs sentences. He puts his fat little handwriting, like to make it clear who's boss. Legend's right. I'd take her, but she's too conspicuous. It'll turn up. I decided to keep it. The judge groaned and raised his head. Mike punched him in the eyebrow and immediately split it. A few red drops fell on his black silk pajamas. Pete stopped his accomplice from waving his fists around. They still needed that judge. He was slowly coming to his senses. He blinked his eyes and tried to focus on them. Finally, the cleaver stopped working and Herbert's consciousness cleared. Did you recognize him? Pete asked with a grin. Of course, replied the judge. Surprisingly, his voice was calm. Pete even thought he was smirking, and it made him want to split his other eyebrow. But he held back. Do you know who you put in jail? Pete said menacingly. Oh, exhaled the judge. Specify the month, or at least the year. I've imprisoned so many. He was about to say fallen, but stopped himself. Don't piss these criminals off. Breaking into a judge's house, that's taboo in the criminal world. Outlaws, thought Herbert, but for some reason he remained calm, though his hands were trembling. I don't think they'll notice. You know everything, Pete smiled. You're a clever boy. After the fear experienced at the beginning, the ringleader had already gained complete control of himself. During the trial, the judge was a king and a god, but now he was pathetic. Now he only had to pretend that everything was under control, that now the cops would jump out of the sky and save him. In reality, none of that would happen. Now, tonight, he and Mike are judges, and that justice of the peace is going to be in trouble. All right, Herbert shrugged. I recognize you. I recognize you. Did you recognize me? Did you guess what we're going to do to you? Mike grinned. He had ghastly black teeth, a horror for a dentist. Of course, replied the judge. If you've come without masks, you'll kill me. Otherwise, I'll recognize you. What a clever boy. Pete splashed his hands together. We'll kill you at the end. And first, we'll torture you. We'll torture you. We'll remember everything about you, every sentence you've been sentenced to. Oh, it's gonna be long, I promise. The judge sighed. Whether he was naturally so calm or whether he was able to hide his emotions skillfully, most likely, the second he should not show his attitude to what is happening. 
But this detachment of Herbert's was beginning to get on Pete's nerves. No, we've got to break that bastard. Aren't you going to say anything? He asked. We'll torture him, I said. You don't even know how to live. You ain't never been beaten or tortured by the cops, like me or Mike. No torture, the judge admitted. I'll tell you one thing before you guys get in trouble. If you untie my hands right now and give me the phone, I'll have you tried for attempted robbery only. And if you kill me, you won't live to see trial. And you know that better than I do. Everything that happened before was just a warm-up. No one will forgive you for killing a judge. Pete's shivering. He's suddenly cold. The judge is right. Of course, they'll do a clean job. They won't leave any evidence. But still, the cops will dig their hooves into the ground. And if they get lucky, no, that can't be. It just can't. We got to open the safe, get the cash, take out the judge, and then we're out of here. Except burn the house down, but that's for later. You know the Hill District, the judge continued, as if noticing Pete's confusion. There's a camera on every pole. You guys are on the radar. You guys are notorious. You shit where you live. The bastard touched the statue and left marks on it. You'll be easy to find, my good men. At those words, the judge smiled as if he'd taken the initiative. Or maybe he's a real badass and he's not afraid of anything. Pete looked over at Mike and he lowered his head. Did he really touch him? Is it true? Pete asked his partner in crime. No big deal, Mike replied, taking the statue and rubbing it on his clothes. The leader swore, grabbed the trinket, and threw it at the wall. It shattered into tiny pieces. Well, Pete asked, how long will forensics look for this ashhole cells in the shards? Okay, shrugged the judge, but they'll find you anyway. So the only option is to untie me and give me a phone. I'll put in a good word so you can sit there like kings. You'll be out on parole in five years. I can really do that. That's when Mike laughed. How many times had the cops promised him that for a clean confession? And how many times had they cheated him? Pete suddenly calmed down too. No, they won't screw up. They'll burn the house down and all traces of it with it. They'll go away, lay low. And when they find it, they'll say no. Cops aren't stupid either. No evidence, no case. And it's not like they're gonna jump out of their skin for this judge. Let's cut to the chase, Pete said. There's a safe behind your back. I can certainly open it with a hammer and chisel. Until your hands, the judge asked. I'll open it. Well, no, said Mike and moved in close to the prisoner. His stinking breath made Herbert cringe. Tell me where the key is. There is no key. It opens by fingerprint, the judge replied and bit his lip. I wish those scumbags hadn't cut it off. A fingerprint, Pete brightened. Those fat fingers. Which one? The big one, answered Herbert, and he became visibly nervous. Untie my hand and I'll open it. Take the money. I don't care. No, said the ringleader. Why bother? You're the one who has to get up. Go to the safe. Or the two of us have to carry you back and forth. No, that's not gonna work. All right, Mickey, get the knife. Mickey. His partner in crime started going through his pockets. He had a puzzled look on his face, like he just remembered he'd forgotten to buy bread or sour cream at the store. And the more he made, the more Pete became exasperated. He said to bring a knife. Everyone knows Mike's a master with a blade. What's this dumbass gonna torture the judge with? A finger? He's gone, Mike said guiltily. You're the one who screwed. Pete yelled. Do you have a knife at home? The leader asked the judge. No, replied Herbert. We don't cook for ourselves. Of course he was lying, or even mocking. Mike swung to give the prisoner another blow, but Pete took his arm. He looked at the judge and smiled his ugliest smile. That fool thinks they're just thieves, petty jacks. In fact, they've made a mess of things. The same ones Frankie went to jail for. Do you remember what Frankie was on trial for? Pete asked. Yes, 
Herbert answered, Of course I do. Murder with particular cruelty, for profit. Was that enough evidence? The ringleader grinned. It's all in plain sight. We did a clean job that time. I was convinced it was him, the judge explained. He was convinced, Pete said. Left witnesses, knife planted. Frankie worked like a god. I think I can see who helped him now, said Herbert. That character couldn't have done something like that alone. That's right, Pate said. He wasn't lying when he said he didn't torture the patient. It was a non-literal word for a poor man who had bled to death after being stamped repeatedly with a knife and a hammer. Looking into his eyes, Herbert saw the fire of madness. Dozens, hundreds of criminals had passed through him, and he seemed to have learned to read their minds. Frankie wasn't lying, Pete repeated, but he didn't turn me in, and neither did Mike. And you shouldn't have judged him. What difference does it make? Herbert shrugged. The verdict's in, there's nothing I can do about it. Anyway, either you tell me where you keep a good knife, Pete began, or I'll go outside, go over to the barbecue, and get a hatchet. I saw it on the way over here, and I'll chop off your whole hand. So be it, exhaled the judge. Yeah, the safe was stupid. He didn't want to lose a finger to modern technology. Knives in the kitchen. I don't know how you guys didn't figure that out. The bell. A real bell on a real doorbell. Mike raised his gun in surprise and accidentally pulled the trigger. The gunshot filled the room with the smell of smoke and Pete's ears whistled. What an armless stretch. The judge chuckled he was amused. Looking at that satisfied face, Pete wanted to do him right now, but he held back. The time hadn't come yet. Pete knew he wasn't cut out for a family. He'd had a few homes in his life where he'd been welcomed like family. And at first, he'd enjoyed it. The first three or four days. And then, then the women asked too much. Like not looking at other skirts and not to take them home. Is it his fault they choose him? There came a point in his life with Barbara when he got bored with her. And he was just looking for an excuse to leave her. You love her. Don't you? Are you sure you're not deceiving me? Barbara asked him in a playful voice, as if she were talking to a child. She was crazy about Pete. Bold, strong, bossy, a real man's man. She'd never met anyone like him in her whole life. No, her lover smiled. No, he'd never cheated anyone. For as long as she could remember, Barbara had felt sorry for herself. In her 38 years, She'd given up her career as a teacher to have a child, divorced her husband, and looked for any kind of part-time work, just to make ends meet. For two years now, she has been cleaning the house of a judge. She doesn't know who he is, what court he is from. She only knows that he is a big man. And if Herbert can still be tolerated, he is silent all the time. But his chatty wife, I can't stand it. Everything's wrong with her. Didn't mop the floors right cleaned the oven wrong. She left a scratch on the expensive faucet. I can't believe it. And they pay her three pennies, but she's broke. The judge, of course, gets a normal salary, Barbara thought aloud. But it wouldn't be enough. You know how much houses cost on the hills. Pete was silent. He didn't know. Having spent his entire childhood on the balls, he had a vague idea of paying for electricity, water, gas, and land taxes. That wasn't the way it was done in his den. And then there are the prisons, the lockups, the colonies. You pay there for years, so you don't think much about money. The point is, his wife sells houses, Barbara explained. She's a realtor, and somehow her clients are connected to the judge. Well, I guess so. And Herbert himself is complicated, too. He's the only heir to some kind of family. So he's got it all, all the money. They only drive Mercedes. All their clothes, every last sock is brand name. So they sit on the money and they sleep on it. Look at this, she pulls out her phone and shows me around. The judge's house is the only thing they talk about. Money, money. No, her first and only. Husband didn't drink or smoke. He was just greedy, 
stingy. He never once invited her to a movie or a cafe, but only drove her Cadillac to the countryside. Well, what happens there? That's right, unplanned children appear in nature. When he found out, he yelled at first, demanded not to have the baby. But going to the doctor is also money, and he was sorry. Besides, he found out that every mother gets an allowance, and then he offered to live together. He got a notebook and wrote everything down in it. Every sneeze, every penny. Not a husband, just an accountant. They had money, in short. Barbara rolled her eyes dreamily. The chickens wouldn't peck, and they pay me three kopecks. Barbara began to cry with resentment. Her first, and only, husband wrote everything down in his notebook, every penny, and he forbade his son to buy yogurt. So he didn't give her anything at all, he took all her allowance. Like he had to keep a budget. She was almost starving, and she couldn't figure out where the money went. She couldn't stand it and left. Where's the money? Pete asked lazily, but he memorized everything. It is known where in the safe. Barbara answered and she also showed the picture. Pete was not like her ex. He spared nothing for her, and especially often he gave her jewelry. Even though they weren't new, that was nothing. This necklace has a scratch on it, and this chain has a black dot on it, and he told me not to wear it or they'd steal it. He was thoughtful, took her to restaurants, and once he even beat up a waiter. He brought her steak and potatoes, and there was a hair on the plate. Not even a hair, a hair. If she'd been alone, she'd have just cleaned it up and eaten, and then leave a tip. But Pete's not like that, no. He knows his rights. And when the waiter said something wrong, a little bit rude, that's when it started. Oh, he gave him a beating. Barbara was crazy about this tough guy. I don't care if he was six years younger. Love doesn't look for peers. And you saw it, Pete yawned. That money. You're imagining things, sweetheart. Where does an honest judge get money from? He's a decent man, living on his salary. Yes, of course, Barbara said. On his salary, yes. There's a safe in the bedroom. The judge's cheap wife opened it once, and I was walking down the corridor. So she didn't see me. She didn't notice me. She doesn't notice anything but herself. There were green packets in there. Wraps, just like in a jar. I don't think they were wrappers. And above them, you know, there was a huge cannon. It's like the king of cannons. It's all right. We'll get rich too, Pate said, hugging his mistress. Come here, baby. Oh, by the way, she's gabbing. The judge is alone on November 11th. Can you believe it? His wife's out there spending money. Sailor Schmeiler. And Herbert's given me a vacation until the 14th. We could go somewhere with you. I've got some money saved up that I can afford. Of course, Pete answered. He was getting tired of this woman. No, nothing like that. She's still pretty good looking, good figure. And every day she crawls around the judge's house on her knees, collecting dust. And that smile. And she looked at him with love. You could feel it. Pete never suffered from a lack of female attention. All his ladies were beautiful and they all loved him. He didn't. It wasn't Barbara's figure, of course, or her small apartment on the outskirts of town. He didn't care where he lived. And it wasn't his mistress. He'd never been picky or choosy. No, she was good. Except that she talked a lot. Too much. He would have liked to lie in silence, to think over all the details of the plan. Now, if anything happened, she'd be sure to rat him out. Anyway, Barbara was talking nonstop, talking so loudly that Pete had a headache. It was all a couple days ago, and it feels like a lifetime ago. But now Barbara won't say anything to anyone. Never. The doorbell rings. The sound is exactly what it should be in a big house. Loud, demanding enough to be heard even on the second floor, and the little bugger who pulled the trigger out of surprise. Now, a visitor's not gonna just walk away might even suspect something wrong. The shot made the judge jerk, and the robbers pretended everything was going according to plan. But Pete was really scared, 
and his first thought was to run, jump out the window. Are you waiting for someone? Pete asked, yawning. Yes, Herbert answered. His voice was calm again, though blood was still oozing from the wound above his eye, and the prospect of losing a finger was truly frightening. Who's that? Pete wondered. It's late. It's past your bedtime for old men like you. The mistress, the judge shrugged. She always comes like that, when the wife isn't home. Who the hell is the mistress? Mike exploded, grabbing Herbert by his pajamas. You old devil, a beautiful one. The judge replied and immediately took another punch in the face. His cheekbone burned with a fire of pain. Pretty, Mike thought. Pretty is good. They're still looking at life in prison for killing the judge. So if you add in the abuse of a beautiful woman, it wouldn't change much. That's if they get caught. And if they don't, then one more, one less makes no difference. The bell rang again. How do they live here? It's so loud. It's like it's ringing right over your ear. Pete couldn't concentrate properly because of the ringing. We should open it, Mike said. No, Pete said. It'll ring and then go away. We should open it, Mike said again. What if she saw us? What if she heard a gunshot? What if she calls the cops? Women are like that. They get nervous when they see something. How would you know? Thought Pete. He knew his partner in crime had no luck with women. We'll get her and that, Mike went on. It seems he's already got lustful plans for this woman he's never even met. Pete thought for a moment. On the one hand, the jackal was right. The judge's mistress could have seen the light in the window. And how could she not have heard the shot? She wouldn't leave, she'd break in, or even open the door with her own key. Who knows what kind of manners there are here? Barbara didn't say anything about a mistress. She might not have known. On the other hand, the lustful fire in Mike's eyes made it clear what he wanted to do with the woman. Masks, Pete said. You stay here and don't go anywhere. Okay. Okay, Herbert replied. I'll sleep while you and my mistress have fun. It's night, and he's sitting in his old Ford playing a chess game in his mind with himself. Surprisingly boring, if you ask me. Why does everyone think chess players are so special? That their intelligence, ingenuity, and diligence will give them something in life. Another disappointment is the public perception of police work. In the movies, cops sit in cafes all the time, eating donuts and drinking coffee. For his 20 years of impeccable service, Felix has never once had a good vacation and did not even go to the sea. He had already reached the rank of major, but still sat his pants in ambushes, solved the most complex crimes, and he could not even make repairs at home. No time. Why would he renovate a house he's never in? Harry, where the hell are you? He asked into the phone. His partner's sleepy voice was more eloquent than any words. Sorry, boss, overslept, he answered, yawning. Here, I'm getting in the car now. Here, I'm on my way. We discussed and planned everything, Gar. Felix hissed. Do you realize what he's risking? Do you realize what will happen to us if anything happens? I'm on my way, boss, Harry continued. Here, I'm putting my pants on. Give me 30 minutes. Oh, shit. Felix exhaled and hung up. The lights came on on the second floor of the judge's mansion, right in the bedroom windows. Had he missed them? No way. They must have come in through the back patio, the way Barbara had set him off. Right past him, Felix. Or did the judge just get tired of waiting and decide to call it quits? Should I call him right now? No, we can't risk it. Felix got out of the car. Despite his considerable size, and he weighed more than a hundred kilograms, the detective moved surprisingly easily and quickly. He ran to the gate. Oh shit, it's locked. Who locked it? He swung over the fence, although the extra pounds immediately made his joints suffer. Rounded the house and ran to the front door. Damn it, it's open. He was alone, no partner, no force support, not even armor. There was body armor on his mighty body, 
but it was a lot of pressure. It's a problem to spend an hour in it, but what if you have to sit in an ambush all night? Armor's great when you're trying it on in the armory, but as soon as you go out into the field, you die. The detective carefully opened the door, stuck his nose inside, so they got through. He missed them, all smart and professional. All right, let's listen. Herbert's a tough guy. He was in the Marines. He's the kind of guy who doesn't whine. There were voices coming from the second floor. Of course, he could rush up there right now, shoot the thugs. They walked slowly down the stairs, looking around. From here, they couldn't see whether someone was standing on the doorstep or not. If it was a woman, she would know how difficult it was for elderly men to get out of bed and down from the second floor. She'll wait. We need a plan. And the ringleader was frantically thinking of one. I'll go out the back, Pete whispered. You wait half a minute and then slowly, barely, open the door. You just open it. Don't come out. And when she comes in, we pack. You in the front, me in the back. You got it. Aha. Uh -huh. With the Glock in his waistband, Pete ran through the judge's precinct. The grounds had clearly been done by an expensive gardener, and the area looked more like a park. I wish I hadn't tripped, Pete thought as he made his way around bushes, plants, and decorative rocks. The front door was empty. No one. Then it swung open and slowly opened inward. Taking out a Glock, Pete took a step inside and immediately got hit on the head with a hard object. Holy shit! The ringleader swore. You hit like a woman. Where's the broad? Mike asked. I don't know, Pete said. She left. There was no one there. Probably didn't wait, Mike shrugged. Maybe they have some kind of signal. Enough fantasizing. Pete rubbed his bruised head. Change of plan. We go upstairs, open the safe, and kill the judge. What about torture? Mike objected. I'm getting ready to get my ass kicked in here. Shut up, Pete demanded. Go to the kitchen and get a knife. No, I'll pick it out. The leader darted into the living room, where there was an oven, a dishwasher, a sensor-controlled hood, and other trappings of the luxurious life of cooking at home and for yourself. Drawers, drawers, drawers. Where are the knives? Mike started going through the drawers, opening them and throwing out plates, pots, spoons, and cookware. He didn't know their names anyway. Looking for this, Mike asked, pointing to the knife rack. Shut up, Pete yelled. The sidekick was getting on his nerves. The leader chose a long serrated knife and a pair of fish shears, just in case. Pete imagined the judge yelling and lashing out as he cut off his finger. Oh, what a good feeling. Avenge all the thieves, robbers and thugs who'd been innocently convicted. Mike picked up some kind of knife, too, but a simpler one. I'll cut it myself, Pete muttered as they made their way to the second floor. Chief, let me do it. Mike started to argue. I'm a professional. Shut up, said the leader. I'm in charge here. What? Mike was indignant, blocking the stairs. Say that again, Pete said, and slapped the jackal on the cheek. The jackal swallowed his insult like he always did. Well, chief, whimpered the sidekick. The main thing is to know how to approach him, and then he's like silk. Why is everyone so afraid of him? All right, Pete said conciliatingly. Cut off his other one, or his nose, whatever you want. Can I have an ear? Mike smiled with his black teeth. You can, nodded the leader. And while he's writhing around in blood, get in the car and get the canister. You got it. Uh-huh. I got a feeling, you know, like we're not doing enough, you know? Pete froze in front of the bedroom, and Mike crashed into him. I don't get it, thought the thug. How is this possible? There you go. There you go whispered the jackal. How is that possible? Pete looked in front of him and didn't understand anything either. He was scared, but he didn't show it. You can never admit you're scared. You'll lose face. You have to be calm, confident, and assertive. That's the kind of man women like. But 
but for some reason his hands began to tremble. They had another fight. They fought again. They fought like hell. Why can't her mother be a normal person? Why does she always want to be in control? She'd always try to live up to her parents' expectations, of course. But Laura was different at heart. Not the way her parents had raised her or the teachers at school had seen her. At heart, she wanted to be a bully, wanted to be reached out to. Then they went to some fancy boutique, where mom made a scene because the cooler with free water was empty. She almost cried when the skinny girl, a consultant, changed the huge bottle. And when Laura wanted to help her, her mother roughly grabbed her shoulder, so hard that she left finger marks. Then she demanded a huge discount. And even when it seemed that Dionysus himself, the god of commerce, apologized from heaven for the awkwardness still left offended. So Laura ran away. The hour is late, so it would be quite possible to walk to the mansion, go up to her room and relax. That's okay. The guest house would be quite suitable to spend the night too. Get some rest, get my thoughts together properly. Her parents don't know that this outhouse has long been her secret hideout. Why? They don't get many visitors anyway. Except for her. Laura walked across the property and quietly went inside. Ever since she was a little girl, her parents had been nagging her about money. And now she is 18, and she wants to feel life. The very taste of life. To order in a French restaurant not French fries, but some exquisite dish, which, according to legend, was invented by Napoleon. Throwing yourself at a store clerk just because it's the right thing to do. Tip her. And she listens to 24 by 7 about how important it is to follow her mother and father's instructions to get anywhere in life. They sent her to this college, but she doesn't want to be a lawyer or a realtor. She likes to draw, dance and sing, making funny TikTok videos. She's a creative person, and her stale parents don't even have a spark of inspiration. All Stu has to do is climb the fence carefully, so his dad doesn't see him. He comes over a lot, and her parents don't approve. Well, mostly mom disapproves, but dad doesn't even mind. Dad spoils her with everything but attention. Stu in the guest house, they either don't notice or pretend not to. But she's 18 now. She can do whatever she wants. My body is my business. Stu's good. He's beautiful in every way, and how much he loves her. I don't think she'll ever meet another man in her life who's so close, so sincere, so her own. But in her mother's opinion, he has a huge flaw, a gigantic one. He comes from a very simple family. His parents never earned anything and rent a small apartment under the mountain. She has opportunities and connections. When she got the name and patronymic of her daughter's boyfriend, she immediately found out their entire history down to the third knee. And she gave her ruthless verdict, poverty. For a mother, it's the worst disease of all. You might think that a person's virtue is measured by his income or property. But parents think like this. If you're poor, stay away from my daughter. Mom wants the children of ministers and other bigwigs, TV anchors, politicians. She already wiped her tongue in blood, telling me how important it is to get married right. Mom, what husband? I'm 18 years old, and if she ever marries, it will be for love. If she ever has children, it'll be with her own man. She threw off every last bit of her clothes and went into the bathroom. Even here, in the guest house, her parents had spared no expense. Huge, with a jacuzzi tub, just a pleasure machine. A special pump filled it with water, a temperature that could be adjusted to a degree in a matter of minutes. I looked at myself critically in the huge mirror. Yeah, the sides could use a little trimming and a tighter stomach. I should definitely do sports, go to the gym. But mom was always missing there, so she wanted to do the opposite. It's easy enough to go on a diet, but Stu loves her just the way she is, which he's always emphasized, by the way. Throwing a foam bomb into the water, she slowly submerged herself in. The warmth and fragrant smell immediately filled her soul with peace. 
She unraveled her white hair and placed her head on the special recess. God, it felt so good, so comfortable. When Stu came, she would be waiting for him. She'll take him in her arms, tell him everything that's in her soul, and he'll listen, listen, listen. Castles and rich houses have secret rooms, halls, and galleries. It's as if wealthy people have the secret of the fourth dimension the one that could be extended indefinitely. How am I any worse? Thought Herbert when they designed the house. It was done by his own people, so they were willing to do whatever he wanted, knowing his finances. No, his mansion wasn't like a castle, although Herbert's blue blood demanded something like that. In this fashionable neighborhood, where he barely bought a plot of land, he'd be misunderstood. He had pledged not to build a structure higher than 10 meters with a chimney and a weather vane. What's a castle without a tower? He had to settle for a rather compact but rather luxurious mansion. Obeying the instincts of an ancient family, he laid a secret passage through which he could escape. To leave, to vaporize, to vanish. It was how the nobles had escaped sieges and attacks in their castles hundreds and even thousands of years ago. Moving along the secret corridor, the judge felt something similar. True, he wasn't going to go far. This house had been built ten years ago and had been designed even earlier. Sylvia, of course, had objected to the county thing. She's a realtor. She knows how to count money. What she couldn't understand was how to reflect these hidden squares in the blueprints. How to hide your own secret passageways from friends who need to show off. We won't be able to sell it later, she said. No way, replied the judge. I'll never sell it. I'll die here. Herbert was adamant. Even then, more than a decade ago, he had put a lot of bad guys behind bars. Gradually, the number had gotten over a hundred and he'd lost count. Who knows if one of these thugs might want to come in to get even. Such ideas must have visited the accused at least once when they sat on the other side of the iron cage. Not right away, but after the verdict is announced. When you're a judge at that level, when you're working with murderers, rapists, and crime kings, you have to be prepared for anything. But that wasn't the case at all. Herbert had a very strange relationship with the law. Maybe he had once dreamed of changing the world and putting all criminals behind bars. But even then, that wasn't his main concern. It was not for the justice of the world that he spent years doing the rough work, passing exams and obtaining permits, convincing all kinds of examiners of the purity of his thoughts. Herbert, as a man of passion and adventure, simply loved adrenaline. He liked to be the center of attention. All those journalists, lawyers, assistants and all eyes are directed at him. He is the king and lord of Themis, he can pardon or put away. He is the embodiment of Themis. What a heady feeling. And when Felix, his old acquaintance, not friend by any means, voiced his plan, the judge laughed at first. Yes, it was funny to him. The detective wants the two thugs to be tried by the law. No, think about it. And then Felix played a very different tune. He offered to get justice on his own and he got through to the judge's heart. Herbert liked that, but, understand, said the detective, sitting in a leather chair. In the judge's chambers, they were just like that. I mean, they're serious. I know these guys well. They'll stop at nothing. They'll spend years figuring out how to get to you so they can send you to the afterlife, if it's just you. I understand, Herbert nodded. At first, he listened to Felix half-heartedly, going through his papers. His upbringing and corporate ethics did not allow him to kick him out. If he came, he could sit there until he got bored. We must, continued the detective. We have to stop them. Well, stop them, the judge sneered. The case is very delicate. Mr. Herbert, Felix wouldn't stop. Tell me honestly. Has it ever upset you that we have a ban on the death penalty? The lights in the secret part of the mansion did not work, and he had to move in pitch darkness. The fuses must have blown, and he didn't notice. The judge didn't come here often, so he wasn't sure he remembered the layout down to the meter. 
three flights of stairs, then a small tunnel. You could call it a corridor. At the end of the tunnel, no, not a light. There's a room, the most secret room in the neighborhood, his own private secret office. He never imagined when he agreed to Felix's venture that someone would scout this part of the mansion. Showing off the escape staircase and room wasn't part of his plan. Not even his wife has access to this place. Maybe we can keep it a secret. The death penalty, the judge haughtily told Felix then. Mr. Detective, the correct word is capital punishment, and it's not outlawed. There's just a moratorium on its use. I'm a member of the judiciary. You should go to the legislature, speak in parliament, maybe convince them of your rightness. So, let's do it ourselves, smiled the detective. What are these legislators to us? Indeed, smirked the judge. All they do is make up laws. My God, who am I hearing this from? Yes, that's all. Felix smiled his predatory smile. It didn't scare the judge, but it made an impression. Laws are like that, like a mirror. Whichever way you look at it, that's what it reflects. You know who's sleeping with your Barbara. Years on the job have taught Herbert to hide his emotions and even his feelings. So when Felix said with your Barbara, he could barely contain himself. Who does that cop think he is? Okay, she comes into his office, insults the legislature, but there's a limit to everything. No, Barbara wasn't his. She was a nice looking woman, but there's hundreds of them. She just cleaned his mansion because Sylvia's lazy and rich. Even if he hugged Barbara a couple times and kissed her on the cheek, it's none of the detective's business. And he could hardly know for sure what had happened or would happen between them. It's none of my business, the judge replied. She's just a housekeeper. There were before her, there will be after her. Let her sleep with whom she pleases, I bless her. With Pete, the detective continued, staring at the judge. Dirty Pete, you scoundrel. Herbert slammed his fist on the table. He felt hot and jumped up from his luxurious leather chair. It can't be. How did that scoundrel even come upon her? He himself, himself, had chosen a woman who would have a minimum of social contacts. How long ago? I do not know, yawned Felix. He was in no hurry. Realized the judge was on the case. I've only been watching him for a month ever since you put Frankie behind bars. Why did I trust those ash holes? Thought the judge as he went down the secret staircase. Why did I agree to help? Going over the events of the night in his head, he didn't even know at what exact moment things had gone wrong. At first, Felix had said he'd be on duty alone with a partner. No force support. He's an experienced detective, of course. But Barbara must have gotten it all wrong. The big sale starts at zero hour on November 11th. That's why he sent his family on vacation on the ninth night. So they could be the first to get to an Apple store and buy the latest gadgets. And on the 10th, he waited for guests. He waited all night and not just him, but a bunch of cops. No one came. Then it became clear that the thugs might show up on the 11th. Or not show up at all, Felix said. But that's unlikely. I'll still be on duty. Don't worry, the team is close by. We'll have them on the alert in no time. Then he, an experienced judge, simply lay down on the bed. To lie down, for he had not slept a wink all the night before, and what sleep was there in the daytime? He put on his pajamas just to look good. You wouldn't just lie on the bed in jeans, would you? And then, then, Dirty Pete and Stuffy Mike woke him up. For a few long minutes, while Herbert waited for help, he was really scared. Here came the iron door, felt it with his hand. Thank God, he had not mistaken the direction. In his hands he clutched his rifle, which he had taken from the safe. It was a good time to remember his army past. Now he'd sit in ambush and guard those bastards. Of course, the cold November weather wasn't conducive to waiting, but it wasn't likely to last long. The disguised door from the secret room led to the garage, where it was camouflaged as a tool cabinet. To get out, he had to bend over three times. 
In fact, he never used that exit, and he went to his secret room from the bedroom for certain reasons. Running out into the lot, Herbert rushed toward the rockery. Going around the back of it, he lay down on the fanciful composition of rocks and plants. It was a little rough, but it would do. He put three bullets in those thugs' foreheads for every punch to the face, and then he'll deal with Felix. Is it stupidity or treachery? There he is, one of them, sneaking up to the guest house. It's him. Black jeans, jacket, broad shoulders, stuffy Mike, no less. Why'd they name him that, by the way? All right, so they've already searched the mansion. They're fast guys, that's for sure. Herbert pulled the trigger and pointed the barrel at the dark figure. He held his breath and began to count the beats of his own heart. One, two, three. Slowly, carefully pulled the trigger. The silence of the night was broken by a powerful shot from his state-of-the-art rifle and a flash. As the robbers got used to the idea that the judge had disappeared, they began to look around. Basically, nothing had changed. Only the safe was open. Near it lay the chair to which Herbert had been tied. The rest of the stop remained untouched. Where did he disappear to? Out the window? Or is he sitting in ambush on the second floor? Look, Mike said, pointing his gun at the safe. The money? Yeah, Pete nodded. Money's a loose term. That judge has got as much money as a bank. On the shelves were Franklin's and Grant's, tied up with colorful rubber bands. They were accompanied by some papers, probably stocks and other useless documents Pete didn't know anything about. And above them was a void. The King of Guns, as Barbara had called it, was gone. Far from the fact that this superweapon even existed, though, the cleaning lady could have lied, confused and embellished. I mean, she used to, but now she can't do anything at all. On the other hand, after the night raid, she'd have to find a new job one way or another, which she might not have experienced, so he'd done the right thing, as he always did. How did you tie him up? Pete asked disappointedly. No, really. Like always, Mike told him. Tight. He tied him up pretty good. But the judge must have just lifted the legs of the chair and freed his limbs. First the legs, then the arms. If a man wants to live, all knots are powerless. In the time it took them to go downstairs, check the visitor and look for the knife, they could have run to the Chinese border. What do we do now? We take the money and go, Mike said, pulling a bag out of his pocket. He's a hoarder. No, Pete said. We didn't come here for that. What do you mean? Mike was surprised. You said we'd bomb the place like we always do. You stupid pig, Pete hissed. I said come in, take out the judge and take the money. It's all about him, not the money. Hey, chief, come on, man. Mike said it offensively. Why do you always have to humiliate me? I didn't know it was so important for you to work wet. I just don't like it. I don't want you and me to go to jail forever. You couldn't be more precise, Pete thought. The plan's coming apart at the seams. They stood in the spacious bedroom of the judge who'd sent their best friend to life. They were debating whether to run away or play with fate a little longer. Suddenly, the phone rang. The ringleader heard the tune, the sound of the cheapest of handsets. It was unlikely that their expensive judge was using one. Fuck, did you take the phone to the case? Pete hissed, grabbing his accomplice by the shoulder. It's a lefty, Mike lied. He'd just forgotten to put his phone out. Don't take it off, Pete demanded. Turn off your cell phone. Yeah, that fool's gonna ruin them. He's got his cell phone with him. Think about it. The ringleader took a couple of steps into the huge bedroom and suddenly, no, look at this. What is that? It's like the bookcase has pulled away from the wall a little bit. Pete pulled it towards him out of sheer curiosity. And the piece of furniture, bulky and heavy, suddenly moved easily to the side. And behind it opened. You got a flashlight? Pete asked. Sure, boss. Then go ahead, said the leader, pointing his gun into the darkness. If you see him, shoot him. 
I'll be right here on the lookout, and I'll collect the dough in the meantime. Mike sighed, took out a flashlight, and walked away. He smiled and disappeared into this strange tunnel as if he had to. After waiting a few seconds, Dirty Pete pulled the bookcase back tightly, pulled it toward him. It wouldn't open again. I guess I'd have to pull on some volume. It didn't matter anymore, though. If Mike got lost in the bowels of this luxurious house, he'd get lost. Here, near the closet, was a backpack, the kind of bag that rich people usually used to carry their sneakers to their personal fitness trainer. After shaking the shoes out of it, Pete ran over to the safe and started putting money into it. Each stack 10,000. 15, 20, 30 watts. $370,000. That was a heavy bag. He's rich. Why doesn't this punk trust banks? Mike's a fool, of course. Let the police catch him. The judge said they wouldn't make it to trial, but he's got about 10 minutes to spare. Until Hera gets to the phone, until the police get a patrol out here, until... Pete threw everything they'd found earlier into the bag, and suddenly he heard a shot, loud and powerful. Mike's gun doesn't make that kind of sound. Did that mean he no longer had an accomplice? Stu envisioned how good he'd feel. No, not now, not in a couple years, when he got his way. Laura wasn't beautiful, a little overweight, a little weird, and her closet was ridiculous. But when her mother dresses her up, when she calls her personal hairdresser, it's a different matter. No, of course he loved her in his own way. A beautiful young girl, neat and tidy, and he's an unpretentious guy. But that wasn't the main thing about her. Absolutely not. Laura was the only daughter of Herbert the First Excellent. That was the faculty name of her father, the famous judge. There was no doubt that in time it would be Excellent who would lead the country's judicial system. At the very least, a descendant of an ancient family with money like leaves on a maple tree. And their home. As Stu wandered the corridors of the luxurious mansion, as they poured rabbit stew into a porcelain plate, he felt he had touched something beautiful. It was Laura's mother, that imperious and pompous woman named Sylvia, who spoiled everything. Herbert seemed to accept him, if he was at all interested in his daughter's life. But this megalomaniac never did. Of course, without such a father and home, Laura would never have interested him. He's an ex-football player, tall and stout, smart, charming, and handsome. Girls are so hung up on him. He was good at soccer, but not good enough to be a world-class star. Well, or at least a strong middleweight, so without doubt parted with cleats, gaiters, and shorts, and began to storm the university. At the first attempt, of course, nothing worked out. He was beginning to worry that he would have to go to work as a coach at some school. He spent nights sitting over textbooks, reading, arguing on the internet. That's when he met Laura, right there on the net. She was still in high school, all airy and dreamy. Her last name immediately struck him as familiar. And from there, it was just like that. He got into university. He met Mr. Herbert. He became Laura's official boyfriend, though she didn't take to it with much enthusiasm. Now they studied side by side, she at college and he at university and they saw each other almost every day. He was doing everything he could to become her husband in the near future. This was his ticket to the big time, and he took his relationship with the judge's daughter as seriously as it could possibly be. When she texted him that she'd be waiting for him at the guest house, Stu didn't take it too well at first. Actually, he was going to a nightclub with Larissa. Nothing too serious, just a couple of girlfriends. But he promised her a long time ago, and they'd already picked a club. Besides, Laura had left and was supposed to stay in the city for a few days. Why'd she come back? It's okay, Larissa can wait. She's a random person in his life. There will be many more like her, more than a dozen. Laura's another matter. There was no way he could lose her. That's why. That's why he swam over the fence and quietly, like a thief, snuck around the judge's precinct. In fact, he was a thief. Only he wasn't going to steal some little thing, 
but everything that belonged to the judge's house, along with the house, along with the daughter. There it is, the guest house, and it looks like she's already looking out the window. Oh, Laura was so sentimental, always saying how much she loved him, how she couldn't live without him. All he had to do was nod and agree. Nonsense, of course, but what was his pity? He'd do anything for a judgeship. Wouldn't Herbert help his dearly beloved son-in-law? Of course he will. He will come and offer everything himself. He found the idea very amusing. It was as if he had heard it or read it, but where? He couldn't remember. Suddenly, in the middle of a clear night, there was thunder, and with it, a bolt of lightning that pierced his body. At least, that's what it seemed to him. It was the last thought Stu had time to think in his inglorious life, and even it wasn't original. Mike slowly made his way down the rough concrete stairs, pondering how unfair his life was. Always on the sidelines, even Dirty Pete can slap him in the face just to vent his anger. The girls laugh at his teeth and send him away. Except the ones for whom taking on jackals like him is a profession. But nothing will change after this case. He'll be the talk of the town. First, he'll take down that judge. I didn't even recognize him. It was Hera who baptized him 12 years ago. He sentenced him, a 16-year-old boy, to juvie. And at the same time, he gave him a nickname, Stuffy. Because he was so hot, he was sweating and begging for a window. And the judge smirked. Stuffy. Hera asked then, It's all right, you'll bear it. The accidental nickname stuck to him for the rest of his life. First the guards called him that, then his cellmates, and then everyone. But he begged, 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 call me Mickey, like Mickey Rourke, or Mickey Mouse. But the people around him were adamant, so he became Douchy, or at best Mike. First term was the dumbest thing ever. Broke into someone's house for no reason, no particular purpose. He saw some nice clothes, expensive, new clothes. I changed. Thought the house was empty, but the owner's daughter was there. He just got scared and didn't do anything, even though he could have. He would have done something now, but not then. He just ran away, happy to be dressed nice. Walked around the neighborhood like a turkey, showing off. Till the cops picked him up tonight, they mocked and jeered at him. All because he'd left his jacket at the scene of the crime, with his card from the school for troubled teens. Hera also laughed when he interrogated him and got to that inglorious moment. Two years of juvenile detention. That was tough. Perhaps he hadn't even had a decent meal in two years. And not once did his mom come to bring him a bun or a candy bar. But it's okay, Mike didn't break. He learned to steal chocolates and buns from his cellmates, or rather, there they were called differently from his comrades. There he learned other useful things, for example, to send the tutors, who were more like wardens far away, to ignore any work, even if the class as a whole was interesting to him. For this reason, Mike had to grind through his two years day by day, and in the end, he was given a disgusting, unreformable characterization. So, when he was caught by the cops again a couple months after his release, his fate was sealed. Again the isolation center, again imprisonment, only in an adult colony. So he traveled through camps and prisons. Small terms in the zone, and even less weeks in freedom. The whole world had already given up on Mike. A thief, a vagrant, what can you take from him? He'd go out, knock over some house and start all over again. The judges even seemed to take pity on him, giving him short sentences. That was until he met Pete and Frankie. Things were different in their new gang. It's been two years since he's been on the outside. No more petty theft. Every job has to be thought out, Pete used to say. He had a plan down to the smallest detail. He knew how to inspire, he knew how to push. All in all, he was a great guy. And I think Pete taught him how to think, and most importantly, to be different. Pushy, brash doesn't always work for a criminal. Sometimes you have to be gentle and tender, so that your victim can relax.
But Mike saw Pete's flaw a long time ago. He's a coward. He's afraid of everything. On all his cases, he never got his hands wet. It was him, Mike, who used a knife, a gun, or his bare hands. The boss could swing his fists, but that's about it. And Pete was never the first to enter another man's home or office. But Mike had a secret, too. He was the exact opposite of Pete and felt no fear at all. Now, as he walked down the concrete stairs, he looked around curiously. Where was that judge hiding? Hide or not, I'll find you anyway. And I won't be in a hurry, no. Behind his belt was a huge knife he picked up in the kitchen. No, the judge needs some work. The stairs ended. He pushed the door open slowly. It wasn't an easy door. He'd seen them in lockups and prisons before. There was a viewing window on the door and a hinge part for serving plates. Wow, what's this judge doing here? Role-playing with his wife or something. Mike took the latch off, shined the light inside, quiet, safe. The room was cool and damp. It must not have been heated, unlike the house. The flashlight beam traveled along the walls. The room was small, and the concrete floor and walls made it look like a cell in a prison. He shined the light some more. There was a toilet in the corner and bunks attached to the wall. Wow! On the other wall are neat installations made of wood. Some kind of shelves screw to the wall. Small ones, because the big ones wouldn't fit in here. Mike got curious. Inside each picture, as the thug called it, was a large photograph and text. He couldn't read very well, but he recognized the faces in the pictures immediately. Puckett, he thought. Gosha Puckett disappeared three years ago, and this is the senator. They called him that because he always wore a suit to work. He's gone, too. Since Mike didn't feel fear, he felt confusion. On the two remaining installations were portraits of Sini Bolshoi and Vovchik. The latter's nickname persistently did not stick. All these honorable people were united by two small nuances. First, they were criminals and not just any second-rate thieves. The elite of the criminal world. They were feared and respected by right. Secondly, they'd all gone missing in recent years. Basically, for a criminal, Sudden disappearance is the norm. Always got to lay low, wait for the cops to calm down. These guys just disappeared into thin air. Rumors have been flying around the neighborhood that it wasn't an accident. But by and large, thugs don't care about each other. But that's not the only thing that surprised him. In this impromptu exhibit of missing criminals, there were two empty spaces, separate niches, also very nice and neat. The judge wasn't here. If he built the cell, he didn't build it for himself. Part of the concrete wall had been moved forward. Mike shown another small passageway there. Fortunately, he knew the purpose of the next room quite well. A garage, an expensive roll-up gate lifted open. Mike turned off the flashlight, walked to the side of the exit, and carefully looked ahead. Suddenly, there was a flash and a large guy could be seen falling to the ground. Was this part of Pete's plan? And who was the underdog? Pulling out his gun, Mike lay down on the ground and carefully crawled to the side so that his black clothes blended in with the ground. Standing in the shade of a tree, Felix observed the situation. Okay, here came the judge out of the garage with his giant gun at his side. Thank God he's alive so at least nothing irreparable happened here. The justice's gun was a big gun. Rambo himself would have envied such a gun. The judge moved quickly and surprisingly easy adrenaline. Tomorrow it'll break every bone in his body. We've been there, we know. The rifle certainly deserved respect. Probably bought the most expensive and largest one in the gun shop, thought the detective. Looking at the judge, safe and sound, he was greatly relieved. Here Herbert ran up to some artistic pile of stones for which all the rich men groan and weep so much. He lay down on top of it on a patch of grass. Silence. All the lights are out, but thanks to the cloudless sky and the full moon, the situation is clearly visible. There's a man sneaking around the plot. Wait a minute. 
Who's that? Looks like Mike, but it's definitely not him. What's with all the criminals out on the prowl tonight? They're coming to the judge's house in droves. Definitely a thief, Felix thought, as he watched the dark figure look around. He's going straight to the small outbuilding. How small? Only against the backdrop of a huge shack. Well, let him go, and we'll deal with him later. But apparently Herbert thought otherwise or he had decided to deal with all the shady personalities who had flown into his precinct. Here the judge raised the barrel and began to repeat the trajectory of the sneak. Spellbound, Felix stared at him, but could not even think what would happen in the next second. The detective did not have time to realize anything as a rasping shot rang out and the burned gunpowder illuminated the area for a second. The thief collapsed to the ground, an accurate shot the detective dismounted from his position and ran along the fence toward Herbert so that he would not inadvertently come under the judge's fire. Hiding behind the barn, Herbert continued to watch the exit from his mansion. It was unlikely that the remaining burglar would go to the back door. Besides, it was locked securely, so it was necessary to wait a little until the second thug appeared in the target zone. And to get him away from the door a little bit, I don't want to damage the finish. His wife will take his head off and she'll be right. Sylvia would charge him for the hole in the bedroom ceiling. Let him run, Herbert thought. He liked hunting, though the last time he had gone after game was many years ago. Let him, you can't run away from me. Suddenly the judge felt a strong hand grasp his shoulder and a second hand lowered the barrel to the ground. He turned around, wondering how Pete had gotten around him. He was looking in all directions after all, but the strong hands seemed to belong to someone else. Behind him stood the fat detective. How could he sneak in so quietly with his size? His face was confused. Calm down, partner, said the detective. Take it easy, you guys. Where the hell are you? Herbert asked instead of greeting. Where is the other one? Sorry, your honor, said Felix almost sincerely. My partner is in ambush, waiting. No, explained the judge, the second thug. I already got the first one. I got Mike. He's over there, cooling off, and it's your fault, by the way. Herbert, said the detective. I'm sorry, but ah, uh, anyway, it wasn't Mike. It's some kind of a total lefty. Maybe a thief, I don't know. I'd recognize Mike right away. He's taller and bigger. This one's just a kid, not even a belly. Oh shit, the judge whispered. He felt his feet start to get cold. Are you sure? A thousand percent. We should go take a look, said the judge, putting the shotgun away. I think we can help him. Call an ambulance or at least stop the bleeding. No, Felix grabbed Herbert's shoulder. There's nothing you can do to help him. I've seen it a hundred times. Even if he didn't give his soul to God right away, he's dead. You got a big buckshot, and the shot hit him in the chest area. Plus, those bastards are still in there. You come out, you open up. Let's sit in ambush. That kid went that way. The detective pointed to the guest house. It can't be, whispered the judge. I think he saw a light in the window, but not that bright, or was he imagining it? His ears were a little stiff from the gunshot, and his eyes were blurred with light. Where's your phone? He took the receiver from Felix, sat down and began to remember his wife's phone number. Here it was, the 21st century. He used to know several dozen numbers by heart. Why? Because he used to dial them on the machines all the time. First with a round disc, then buttons. And then these smartphones came along. They remember everything. Where you were yesterday. What picture you took a year ago. Come on, my wife's cell phone isn't so easy to forget. He got all the numbers, but the last one. What's on the end, nine or five? Oh shit. The clock on the screen read three in the morning. Right, five is the number of the amendment. Come on, come on, pick up the phone. Honey, he whispered. Darling, it's me. Jira. Are you drunk? The wife asked in a sleepy voice. Did you see what time it is? What is this phone? 
I'm fine. Get up right now and go to Laura's room. Are you drunk? Sylvia hissed unhappily. Now, he demanded, and write a message on that phone if she's not there. Herbert pressed the red button, and just in time, the phone began to vibrate, and the screen showed the caller's number and the name Felix the underdog had given him. You couldn't be more precise, thought the judge with a smirk. The sleuth picked up the receiver. Gah, whispered Felix, are you in the area? A couple minutes away, replied his partner. The sound of the street and the rubbing of tires against asphalt could be heard in the background. Phil, the precinct called. Our client's neighbors heard what sounded like gunfire. Yes, answered the detective, looking at Herbert. He moved in close and tried to hear the conversation too. We're aware of it. Everything all right, Phil? Harry asked. Yes, the judge is with me. Our guys are still wandering around the precinct, but it won't be for long. Should we call for backup? Eagles are standing by. Not as many as yesterday, but still. Not yet, Felix answered, and the judge nodded. We'll take them ourselves. Once you're parked, move out to the... The barn, Herbert whispered. We'll try to lure them there. Go to the barn, the detective repeated. Go quietly. And keep your head down so that so that no one will shoot you. They both looked out from behind. Around the corner, but nothing happened. The waiting was getting tiresome. Herbert thought that the thugs might well have jumped through the window and escaped. Good riddance, as they say. By the way, had he locked the safe, he could have left the door open when he left the room. Yeah, if the thugs just left, that's one thing. But if they took the money, the newspaperman would tear him to shreds, and his own people, his own people will offer him resignation, especially if they find out the judge agreed to work with a cop behind everybody's back. But it's not a crime to agree to play. It's losing. How did he agree to this scam? They say the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Herbert hated himself, literally despised himself. But the detective felt the same way. An experienced policeman, how could he have missed two robbers? Especially if he'd been waiting in ambush for them. Your honor, Felix whispered, bringing his phone to the judge's face. Is that for you? The message on the screen. Well, what does it say? Herbert, she's not here. Call me back, I'm worried. What does that mean? Asked the detective. It means she's back, sighed the judge. Laura, my daughter. Also, I think I know who's been sneaking into the guest house. Mike saw a light on in some building. With the mansion out of the picture, this structure could very well be called a house. Everything was in place. Chimney, veranda, rug, and other attributes of cottages. Only the cottage was smaller, wasn't it? The judge must have gone there. He's resting, hiding. We should take a look around. Mike walked up to the cottage and began to look in every window. There was a faint light burning in one, wavering. It's like a candle being lit, thought the thug. He pressed himself close to the glass, and no, so the judge hadn't lied about the mistress. The fogged glass didn't give him a good look at what was inside, but the long white hair left no doubt. A woman, Mike's brain immediately shut down. Lying in the warm bathtub, Laura stared at the tablet screen. She had tapped into the security cameras and was waiting for her lover. Someone had turned them off an hour ago, but she had turned them back on. She liked watching the property at night, but now, looking at the safe footage, there was definitely some movement on the screen. She stared at the dark figure, switching between cameras. Someone's running with a stick of some kind. No, a rifle. Five minutes ago, a strange sound broke the silence of the night. It sounded like thunder or an engine slamming. Maybe one of the neighbors was celebrating a wedding and decided to set off fireworks. The cameras on the property were good, but not good enough. And then she saw it, a flash. Lo and behold, there was a dork standing on the bathroom doorstep. Laura sat up in surprise, covering her chest with her hand. Who are you? She asked, frightened. And what are you doing here? 
I'll call the police. Well, well. She began frantically tapping on the tablet screen. She was terrified and forgot what the police number was. 119, or was it 991? Suddenly her fingers were no longer obeying her. She felt paralyzed. She'd never felt anything like this before. Yeah, the police, the man smiled, and the girl saw his horrible black teeth. Call the fire department. She was paralyzed with fear. So when the stranger came close to her and slapped her cheek with all his might, she couldn't even resist. He snatched the tablet from her hands and threw it into the water. That's where her dad's birthday present, a brand new iPhone, went. So, how do you call the police now? Asked the dog. No, answered Laura. Why? Why did you hit me? Turn away, please. I want to get dressed, said the girl and suddenly cried. She started to rise, but the stranger grabbed her by the shoulder and sharply put her back down. With force, he removed the hands with which she was covering her breasts, and on his face she saw an expression that frightened her for real. She was suddenly very, very cold. A shiver ran down her body. You're such a sweetie, he said, smacking his lips. You've never even known a normal man, have you? Nothing. Now I'll tell you everything and show you. And with these words, to the girl's horror, he began to take off his clothes, jacket, sweater, socks, jeans. Then she covered her eyes with her hands and saw nothing, only smelled the nauseating odor of a man's body dirty and neglected. From the way the water level in the bathtub rose sharply, she realized he had just sat down next to her. She wanted to scream to call for help, but out of terror, she couldn't even open her mouth. He grabbed her arms and pulled them away, put her in the water, gently stroked her shoulder. The way a cat plays with a mouse never kills it immediately. The girl felt the blood drain from her face. The bathroom around began to spin, and in the center was the black smile of the hubby who had just broken in. Pete, nicknamed Dirty, opened the back door without much trouble and stepped out into the night. People live. The air here in the suburbs was wonderful. His soul was warmed by several hundred thousand dollars, which he put in his backpack. The main thing now was to get to the car, start the engine, and drive away. I could, of course, go back, burn the hell out of this house, but it wasn't worth the risk. Pete ran to the high fence and climbed over it without much difficulty. Oh, how many fences he'd had in his life. How many locks? Well, it's all right to take a break now. We'll have to go away somewhere. Not forever for a while. He could even get himself a new identity. A hundred grand and he'll have a clean passport. But he won't go far. He'll watch the judge from afar. And he's bound to come up with a new plan to get close to this man. He'll probably install new locks. He'll buy another safe, bigger than the last one. Hire a guard or two. No matter what he comes up with, Pete will always be one step ahead. He's a professional, as unassuming and unstoppable as fate itself. There's no other way around it. Frankie, of course, is a pity, a driver and mechanic from God, a great helper and in general. Mike is such a buddy, he is too aggressive, and Pete was starting to be afraid of him. The leader peeked out from behind the trees, looked around, clear. This is Pontiac waiting for him. It's a reliable car, no doubt about it. He left the keys right in the lock. Who would steal a car in this expensive neighborhood? It's a nice car, but it uses a lot of gas. Too bad he'll have to dump it, but that's his lot. A real thief can't have anything permanent. No apartments, no women, no cars. Pete opened the door and took the bag off his shoulder but then someone slapped him across the face with all his might. He fell backwards, the bag fell to the ground, and once of dollars spilled out of it. The same man roughly turned him face down, put his hands behind his back, and delivered another blow to the back of his head. Pete's eyes starred before his eyes. It can't be. He fought feverishly. It just can't be. That's how Dirty was ignominiously caught red-handed at the scene of the crime. The cop was so proud. 
When the detective and the judge ran up to the guest house, Felix's phone rang again. He reluctantly picked it up. Partner, I got one in, Harry reported, sitting on Pete's back. He wanted to put his knee on Pete's neck, but they'd recently been strictly forbidden to do such a thing, on pain of dismissal and prosecution. Who did you take? Felix was surprised. Dirty, answered his partner. I just arrived, I saw his car, about which you spoke. I got inside, I had such an impulse, that's it. It wasn't a minute later he showed up, sweetheart. Where's he going now? Put him in our salon for now, Felix replied. Just tie his hands and feet carefully, and tie his mouth too, and bullet to us. And don't move, there's cameras everywhere. Listen, Phil, don't hang up. Harry said again, there's a whole bag of bucks here. What are we gonna do with it? Take it with you, Felix said. Go to the guest house. It's like a mansion, only smaller. Over and out. Herbert ran up to the cabin and froze in indecision. What was waiting for him inside? What if he opened the door and there was his daughter's breathless body? He had often interrogated relatives of victims in murder cases. Not a pleasant experience, if you ask me. Or did he take a hostage? Your Honor, Felix whispered. Good news. Dirty Pete has been apprehended. Where? The judge was surprised. On the street, answered the detective, my partner. Felix preferred not to talk about the fact that it was a coincidence. After all, luck loves the prepared. Pete was taken on the hot seat. The judge has a couple of bruises on his face. It'll heal. All we gotta do is get the other one, and we're good to go. The judge was silent, and the detective preferred not to ask him any questions. Is this Mike so stupid that he's hiding in the guest house? Or maybe he's taking a bath there? Meanwhile, Herbert opened the front door. It wasn't locked either. At least, the detective hadn't seen the judge fiddling with the locks. Where would he go? This man without a robe. What if Strangled was waiting for him there? The detective ran up to Herbert, grabbed his arm and whispered, Stop. There may be an ambush. I'll go first. To his surprise, the judge agreed and nodded. Felix dismissed him and gestured for him to hide behind the wall. Then the detective ducked to the ground, opened the door sharply and rolled forward. From the outside it looked as if the fat cat had suddenly decided to practice catching mice and he was doing a good job. There was no one inside. Holding the gun in front of him, the detective ran on. He heard voices somewhere nearby, very close. A strip of light was shining from under the white door. He went to it, listened. A familiar voice. That's right, it was Mike. The judge ran up behind him, and the detective raised his hand in the air. In special forces, that gesture meant stop. No, why are you breaking, huh? A man's voice questioned. Come on, I'd rather do it with a live one, okay. But I can do it with a dead one, okay, I'm fine. Felix flipped a switch and rushed inside. Herbert followed him in. When the detective and the judge looked at the situation, they saw a terrible picture. From what they saw, the judge clutched at his heart. He sat down on the floor. It became difficult to breathe. The ceiling and walls swam in front of him. In the middle of all this picture sat his daughter, completely white, and her unseeing eye staring forward. The detective quickly pulled himself together. He ran to the bathroom and shouted, Raise your hands, you. Raise them where I can see them. Felix loved his daughter. She was not just the meaning of life, but life itself. If on one side of the scale put his money, mansion, and position, and on the other Laura, he would choose his daughter without hesitation. One day she climbed a tree in the yard, a maple, neither young nor old, and then she snapped, plummeted down from a height of three or even four meters. Luckily, it was all right. She didn't even break anything, but the doctors at the private clinic had a huge bill. The next day, Herbert went to the barn, took the biggest ax he could find and chopped the maple tree down. One day at school, a bully snatched his daughter's backpack out of her hands 
and then stomped on it with his feet. Herbert didn't rest until he got the kid expelled. Although the parents of the guy tried to find a compromise with him, he loved his daughter, but he didn't know how to express his feelings. He bought her expensive things, cell phones, paid for her girlfriends, but it wasn't an expression of love. And he only started to realize that recently, Sylvia was different. She loved sincerely and hated just as much. Herbert never thought his daughter would come back. If he'd known where this whole adventure would lead, he never would have agreed to it. Yes, he'd noticed that Laura was different. Indifferent to money, his prestigious position, and his expensive college. He'd noticed, but he thought she'd grow out of it. She'd get over it. No, really, what more could you want? Living in such a luxurious mansion, traveling to the best resorts, he put $2,000, $2,000 on her card so she could participate in the sales. Go out, have fun, do whatever you want. But for some reason, she ran away and sneaked into his house. And she did it so quietly that Felix didn't even notice. And now, looking into the glass eyes of his daughter, the judge was prepared for the worst. Pictures of their life together flashed before him. Here he was picking up a tiny envelope from the maternity hospital. Here they were arguing with Sylvia over a name. Then Herbert suggested they write their choices on slips of paper and let the baby choose. And Laura's little hand chose the one with his name on it, probably because the other one had the same thing written on it. Here he was taking her to kindergarten. Expensive, private, but still. He a school, first trip to the movies, first field trip, to but in the school theater. Now Herbert looked into the glass eyes and could not believe that everything was over. The thug sat next to him and smiled. He was definitely amused. The judge wanted to empty the entire magazine of his rifle into him, pointed the barrel right in the villain's face. He kept laughing. Then he turned his gaze to Laura and, oh, miracle, she blinked. His daughter seemed fine to him, as much as possible in a situation like this. A stuffy Mike sat in the bathroom smiling with his hideous black teeth. One of his dirty hands rested on Laura's shoulder and the other on the rim of the luxurious tub. In it he held a gun. As he shifted his gaze from Felix to Herbert, he did not utter a word, nor did he react in any way to the judge's huge gun. Raise your hands, I said. The detective demanded, Well, or what? Asked the thug. Will you shoot me? Yes, nodded Felix. I'll blow your brains out. No, you won't do that. Mike shook his head. That's not who you are. You're a goose. You're a goose. You're a goose. You can't do anything. Get out. Mike, it's over. Felix repeated. No, smiled the robber. I'm fine here with a chick like that. Laura woke up. She looked at her tormentor, and without a word, she elbowed him right in the eye. Mike roared in pain and started to raise his gun hand. But the detective's lightning-fast reaction didn't fail him. In a split second, he was near the thug and knocked the gun out of his hand. Laura threw another blow, then another, and another. Mike himself flew out of the tub. But no, chick, he screamed. You could have just said you didn't like me. Not this. Felix made a slip Mike collapsed to the tiled floor. He laughed as the detective cuffed him behind his back. Dark water dripped off his filthy body. It felt like he'd never washed at all. In a minute, he had a huge puddle of water in which he was floundering like a fish, and he kept laughing. What a night, Mike said. Something to remember in the cell. Get that garbage out of here, Herbert said and walked over to his daughter. Laura, are you all right? But his daughter was silent. She was crying, smearing tears on her cheeks. It's okay, she's a strong girl, the judge thought. She'll get through this. And indeed, Laura sobbed for only a few minutes. Then she wiped away her tears, looked at her father and begged. Daddy, come out of here. I want to wash this filth off me and get dressed. Did he do something to you? Herbert asked. No, she answered. He came in a couple minutes before you. Thank God, 
whispered the judge and carefully closed the door behind him. The detective put Mike on the floor. Herbert tossed the criminal's belongings next to him. Felix put on his pants, boots, and T-shirt and sweater without removing the handcuffs. But he didn't bother to take his underwear and socks. Now the bandit looked ridiculous. Are we going according to plan? The detective asked, looking at the judge. He was silent for a second, then nodded. Yes, replied Herbert. I'll take my daughter now, and we'll start formalizing them. Whatever you say, Felix agreed. Hey, put your socks on, Mike demanded with a smile. My heels are freezing. You'll get over it, the detective spat. He was used to detainees behaving nastily, so the criminal's words did not resonate with him. Returning to his daughter, the judge saw her surprisingly collected and calm, or just detached. She had drained the bathtub, and now her gadgets lay in the fragrant lather. The judge took them out, pressed the buttons. It works. Wow, he hadn't paid that kind of money for nothing. Herbert looked into his daughter's eyes and said, It's no trouble, Laura, that these have sunk. I'll buy you new ones. Go ahead, order them right now. Okay, she muttered. Do you want anything? Shall I make you some tea or heat up some milk? Just take me to my room, Daddy. They walked through the property, and the landscaping now seemed annoying to him. Why does he spend so much time on the picture? Far more important is what's inside. If you want justice, be prepared for someone to get hurt. Justice, like beauty, requires sacrifice. Forgive me, Herbert asked. I'm sorry. I didn't know you were back. But Laura was silent. They went up to the second floor and entered her bedroom. There was still the faint odor of gunpowder in the air. Herbert's pajamas, dirty and torn in several places, smelled of it, too. He only now noticed that his house slippers were on his feet. Now they were ready to go in the trash. Daughter, why don't you say anything? The judge asked. But Laura said nothing. Just lay down in bed, put her head on the pillow, and pulled up the blanket. Herbert sighed. Nothing. He would hire the best psychologists. They will work with her and will definitely help. She's a strong girl. She'll get over it. In a month or so, she'll forget this scoundrel. Stu suddenly thought Herbert, and he felt sick. Poor Stu. The judge went back to his room and went into the bathroom. He picked up a washcloth, turned on the water, and began scrubbing the blood off his face. Then he took out his first aid kit and treated the wounds. It's okay, scars only beautify a judge. After all, they weren't done yet. We need to focus, concentrate. Justice will not restore itself. Then Herbert took off his pajamas and threw them in the washing machine, poured in the powder and turned it on, took out a white shirt and pants. At first he wanted to put on a tie, but then he changed his mind. When the police and those vulture journalists get here, you have to look good. But that'll be later. The scoundrels are well guarded, and there's no hurry. Another hour won't solve anything, not even a little. The judge returned to the guest house. Felix continued to sit beside Mike. He wasn't laughing anymore. Harry was marking something in his notebook. That's the old school, writing everything down. How does he make sense of his scribbles? The detectives looked at Herbert. Felix sighed. He must have felt guilty, and he was right. How is she? The full cop asked. She's having a nervous breakdown, Harry said. Took her into the bedroom, put her to bed, asked me not to call an ambulance. I think we should see this through to the end. That's good, Felix replied, because I'm really determined to get to work. It's like a dream come true. Shouldn't we call for backup, too? Harry asked. No, Felix said. What's the point? We've already held them off. I think it makes sense to stick to the plan. As soon as we leave, the judge will call in a task force. Have them get a proper record of the whole thing. Whatever you say, boss, Harry nodded. But I've already made my point. The detectives looked at the judge. Only now did they notice that he had changed his clothes. Hardy. I'll give you that. 
Bring the other one here, Herbert ordered. It was time to finish. When Harry brought Pete in and seated him beside his accomplice, Mike's face was twisted with anger. The detective placed the bag of bucks next to him. After the bath, the thug smelled like some kind of delicate skincare product. Pete's gaze was cloudy Harry was punching well. Even now, the robber thought he could get away. He could get away with it. So that's what you are, Mike hissed, glaring at his partner in crime. You decided to get away without me, with the money, you rat. Hey, calm down, Pete shouted. Calm down. I was coming for you, if anything. Who's the third guy? Mike asked. Who is he? Who's the third? Pete was surprised. Frankie's in jail, remember? I saw a guy walking through the precinct, Mike said. And the judge took him down. He did. And now. When Felix heard this conversation, he turned around. Harry raised an eyebrow in bewilderment. The older man made a gesture that only they could understand. The detective's partner could only sigh. Well, the door opened, and the judge entered the room. He had dressed his wounds with green, and now he looked strange. You've had enough, boys, said the justice of the peace. I warned you. I even asked you. Go fuck yourself, Mike hissed. You've already ruined my life. It's definitely them, Herbert said. They confessed everything in the bedroom. What are you going to tell them, Felix? The huge cop smiled, showing his white teeth. It must be the smile the lion preparing to swallow its prey. He looked at Mike and Pete carefully and began his story. You think Frankie didn't say anything? Hell no. He told me right off that it was you two scoundrels who'd set the whole thing up. But he didn't want to say anything on the record. He was scared shitless. I needed proof. I wanted to nail you both to the wall. Why? Pete asked. Couldn't sleep at night? I was watching you, Felix smiled again. And when I found out you were sleeping with Barbara, I knew right away that you were digging for the judge. No, Pete shook his head. Coincidence. But things didn't go quite as I planned, the detective sighed, and there was a sadness in his eyes. You showed up here a day later than I expected passed me by. And you've had terrible luck. But he who laughs last laughs well. Night Road. How many times had he, Pete, driven like this? Police cars have bars separating the back seat from the front. And the windows, too. And here he was again, watching the world go by. It's okay. He'll be out soon. In his thoughts, the robot even started to fall asleep. Hey, Mike yelled. Chief, the lot's the other way. You went around the corner. Who said we were going to the station? The fat cop smiled, turning in his chair. You got away. You even made it to the woods. Yeah, his partner echoed him. To the edge of the woods. Did you read the headlines this morning? You tried to escape, didn't you? But you didn't get far. The judge went into his daughter's room. She was awake, just lying there. She's got the same tablet that's not afraid of water. Yeah, that's some rugged tech. They should be launching rockets into space. Stu, she whispered, sobbing. Stu, I'm sorry, sweetheart, replied the judge, holding his daughter to his chest. Those subhumans, those scumbags shot him. I'm really sorry and I don't know how I can live with that. Daddy, Laura whispered, clinging to his chest. Daddy, I saw everything. You saw what? The judge asked in a cold voice. Everything, she answered. I saw the footage from the cameras. You're the one who turned them off. Help. Selena was tearing her throat out, even though she knew no one would hear her. I'm here. She was crying. There was snow all around. And most importantly, there were wolves howling somewhere nearby. It was a clear day. Selena was graduating from school. She knew she had her whole life ahead of her now. She walked home in the morning and smiled. Today, they had welcomed the dawn with the whole class. And now, when there was still no one on the streets, she was walking down the sidewalk, joyful in her heart. Selena, is that you? She heard her mom's voice. Why are you awake? The girl was surprised. 
Today, an important guest will come to my father. Here, I'm getting ready. She wiped her hands on the apron, which was tied on her. Good, now I'll change and help you. Though she hadn't slept all night, she was still strong. Why don't you rest? Mother suggested it. No, I don't feel like sleeping at all, she went to her room. After that, she and her mother cooked, cut and mixed in the kitchen. And by dinner time, so many dishes were ready that it was possible to feed 10 people. That's it. Now we can rest. The mother looked at the prepared treats. And who should come? The girl asked the woman. A friend of her father's. They used to work together. The mother didn't know. Well, this information did not give the girl anything. She went to her room and sat in front of the mirror. She liked to sit there, looking at her reflection, sometimes dreaming about the future. Now, unraveled her hair, brushed it, and wondered what awaited her. I'm home. She heard her father come in. When are the guests coming? His wife asked. Any minute now, Celine knew her father was now looking at his watch. The doorbell rang, and everyone in the hallway fussed. What's the big deal about this guest that mom and dad are acting like this? The girl thought. She went out to help her mother and was immediately seated at the table. Hello. A man looked at her. He wasn't young, but he was handsome. Good afternoon. Selena blushed for some reason. Meet my daughter. This is Sam, a good friend of mine, her father told her. Selena, she sat down next to her mom. Wow. And you didn't tell me you were hiding such a beauty here. The man began to speak. Here, just graduated from high school, boasted the proud parent. Great, said the guest, and then they continued their meal. Selena saw how masculine he was, speaking correctly and beautifully, sat and looked at Sam. It's time to say goodbye, said the evening father's friend. He went to the door, while looking at Selena, she looked at him too. Well, everyone, have a safe trip, shook his hand, the landlord shook his hand. When the door was closed, his mother went into the room to clear the table, Selena followed her. Daddy, who is he? The daughter wanted to ask this at the table, but did not dare. Military, then worked in the organs, and now appointed head of the zone, said the man while taking plates from his mother and carrying them to the kitchen. I see, thought the girl. Why are you interested in him? Father became curious. You cannot ask. Flayed up the girl. Why are you reacting like that? The parents looked at each other. Selena did not answer anything else, silently collected everything that was left on the table, took it to the kitchen, and went to her room. In the evening, she thought about Sam. He was just as she had imagined a real man to be. With these thoughts, the girl fell asleep. Selena was going to enter technical school. Becoming an accountant was her dream. Even as a child, she came to the place where her mother worked, sat at the table, and filled out different papers, as if writing something out. Ready? Her mom asked her that morning when she had to go to the educational institution. Yes, Selena nodded. She walked down the stairs, looking in the mailbox. It had been a month and a half since Sam had been their guest. The first letter from him came practically two weeks after that. The girl herself does not know why she looked in the box. She had never done that before. And then she pulled out the envelope. At first she saw the name. She thought it was for her father, but then she noticed her own name. Selena clutched the envelope to her chest. From then on, she checked the mail every day by herself. In coming, the girl came home. No one doubted it. Her mom smiled, and Selena did not listen to her. She hurried to her room to read what Sam wrote to her, and he sang in his letters how much he liked her and wanted to take her with him. And the girl believed in his love at first sight. Mom, I need to talk to you. She came home from school. It was December. About what? She was always ready to listen to her daughter. About Sam. Selena looked around the room, though there was no one there, but she was so afraid that her father would find out that she feared it even now. Sam, who Sam was talking about, the woman made a surprised face. Well, a friend of her father's who was visiting, 
the girl reminded her. I see, what about him? Mom couldn't understand what her daughter had to do with a grown man. We're in love, the daughter blushed. What do you mean? The woman clutched her heart. It's just, he writes to me, he wants to take me back to his place. She wanted to get up to bring the letters, but she saw what was going on with her mom and decided not to. Selena, what are you doing? She was fainting. Don't tell daddy yet, the girl asked. Oh, what on earth is going on? The mother began to wail. The daughter realized that there was no need to continue the conversation. She got up and went into the room. Now she'd already regretted that she had started this conversation, but it was necessary to prepare at least the mother. Sam had written that he would come on vacation in April and then take her with him. Her father would still find out, but it would be his friend who would tell him. But her mother, she felt sorry for. The rest of the time, Selena was very quiet. She didn't go anywhere to and from school. Why are you always home? Her father asked her. Just not wanting to go anywhere, he still didn't know anything. Her mother walked around the apartment, sighed, but kept silent. Sometimes her husband thought that she was worried about something asked, but the woman still just sighed heavily and went to the kitchen. Spring came. Selena waited for the man she had been thinking about for almost a year to arrive. She was afraid of her father, but she knew Sam was persistent and he would get what he wanted. Mother, set the table, a dear guest is coming. He hung up the phone one weekend afternoon. Selena's heart fluttered. She looked at her mother, who was standing on the doorstep of the kitchen. What a darling, he wants to steal our daughter from us, the old geezer. The woman muttered to herself under her nose. What are you saying? At that moment, her husband came in. Nothing, I'm glad, I say, that Sam is coming. The wife did not turn to him. And so, like last time, the man arrived. They sat down at the table. Selena dressed up, but was shy to go out. It's not like pouring out your feelings on paper when you're alone in the room. Selena, how long do you have to wait? shouted her father. On coming, she entered the hall, a blush flooding her cheeks. Hello, Sam stood up to greet her. I'm glad to see you. She stood in front of them, so young with red cheeks. You? Her dad looked at her. Yes, that's the only reason I came, coughed the guest. He was already standing in front of his beloved's parents. I don't get it. Selena's father stood up too. Listen, don't get too nervous. I liked your daughter back then. I wrote to her, and then it started, Sam said and looked mainly at the woman who was sitting on the couch. What do you mean? The father looked at his daughter and his friend, speechless. Yes, you got it right. I'm on vacation for two weeks, and after that we're leaving, he took the girl's hand. That's a friend. The man grabbed his head. Yes, I almost forgot. He took a ring out of his pocket and put it on the girl's finger. Sam had already arranged everything. While he was on vacation, they were promised to be signed. Today, not many people were already talking, so the man got up and invited Selena to go for a walk. The parents had no choice but to agree. Did you know? The woman was immediately questioned by her husband as the doors closed. I'm sorry, she lowered her eyes. What is it? How could he do such a thing? and I as a fool, him with open arms, my father almost cried. A week later, Selena told her parents to come to the registry office. Whatever they said, nothing could affect the girl's decision. What about school? Mom asked. Nothing, so I'll finish studying, the girl, what she planned, that's what she did. Sam bought her a beautiful dress, in which she was today. It really suited her blue eyes and dark hair. The bride and groom were different. You could tell he was older and she, the young girl next to him. You don't have any regrets? Sam asked her after the check-in. What do you mean? She wondered and laughed back. I can't believe I'm so lucky. He pulled her close to him. When Selena arrived where her husband lived, she was horrified. Constant cold, hardly any civilization. But she kept quiet, didn't say anything about it. Sam, what am I supposed to do? She asked, 
It was summer outside, but the weather bore little resemblance to this time of year. I don't know, Sue. Knit, the kids will come soon. You'll raise them, he was sure. Maybe I should get a job somewhere. She was ready to do anything, just to avoid the time at home, which was dragging on very slowly. Would you like a job at the office? He asked. What do you have to do there? That question came out automatically, and she was all for it. Counting, he laughed. Good, she hugged him. Then it's agreed, you can go out tomorrow, look, learn, and then start working. He was ready to do anything for her. The next day, the girl was already sitting in a small wooden building, where there were two other women besides her. Here, look, here are the magazines, one of them showed her. Good. Selena began to remember what she had been taught for a year at the technical school. All day long, she looked through some household books and other things. By evening, Selena was sure she could do everything on her own now. She wanted to wait for her husband here, but he was still gone, so she packed up and went home alone. Sam never came home for the night. In the morning, Selena was back at the office. Did yours come last night? The woman who had shown her around yesterday asked her. No, why did something happen? She looked at her new acquaintance. Yes, they went to the village, had fun there, Natalie told her. What do you mean? Selena was still naive about it. She didn't understand how you could live with your wife and go to someone else. Is this your first time married? Everyone in the room laughed. Yeah, she didn't realize they were joking. Selena, you have to keep an eye on the man. Natalie wagged her finger. But Sam loves me so much, she cried. Oh, what love these days. The girls laughed again. The girl sat looking out the window. She couldn't understand anything. In the end, decided not to listen to what she was told and asked her husband directly in the eyes. Selena, I'm home. It came late at night. Sam, where were you yesterday? She didn't wait for anything. It was important for her to know. What kind of questions? A man's not used to being talked to like that. A simple question, I'm your wife, I was worried, and you just didn't show up. She looked at him point blank. At work, he froze at first, then continued to undress. That's not what the women say. She chopped off her shoulder. Listen to them more. He walked past her into the bathtub. In the evening, they ate dinner in silence. It was as if Selena's eyes had been opened. For the first time, she regretted coming here. Why hadn't she wanted to get to know the man? Her mother had warned her. Are you coming? Sam asked her this morning. Drive, I'll walk. She didn't feel like riding next to him in the car. Suit yourself, he slammed the door. The man realized he was guilty in front of his wife. He didn't know how to make it up to her. In the middle of the day, he came to her office. Can we talk? He asked Selena. Yes, she looked at her co-workers and walked out. Look, it must be hard for you here. Let's get some assistance, Sam suggested. Where are you going to get them? Selena made big eyes. I've got some people who are trying to get parole. I can get them. He nodded his head at the brick building. I don't even know. She looked back at the door. You're handling bales, logs, things like that. He didn't know what else to say. Okay, Selena agreed then. It was really hard for him and the girls. Then come with me. He beckoned her to follow him. Sam said something to the soldier. He nodded and then ran off. In a few minutes, several young men were standing in front of Selena and Sam. Take your pick, her husband pointed at them. Selena had been looking at the ones standing across from them for a while now. They were all kind of the same, but one was very different. His dark eyes, squint, and something else caught her gaze. It was scary and satisfying. She picked out three, including this stranger she'd been paying attention to. Well, boys, consider yourselves lucky, the supervisor told them. Now it was their duty to help her with whatever the girl said. They were doing a great job, Natalie said, as she watched the young men working hard through the window. It was winter outside, it was very cold, so only the three of them were working. Selena pretended to watch the men, 
but she only had eyes for the one. She would give him sugar or cigarettes when she had the chance. He would just stare and smirk, and Selena's eyes were breathtaking. Thank you, they'd come to sign. Yeah, he looked up and winked at her. Selena knew these inmates knew her name, of course they did, her cum's wife. She didn't, but that was just at first. She looked down the lists. The names of those two didn't interest her much. And this one with the dark eyes was John. Here, he came to work when the first snow began to melt and gave the girl some flowers. They were actually dry sticks, with some fudders on the end, but Selena was pleased. Sam hadn't been around much lately. The girl was offended, so she directed all her attention to John and didn't notice how she fell in love with him. Selena didn't know what he'd done, why he was here, but she didn't care. Selena, are you crazy? Whispered Natalie when she heard her laughing with her new boyfriend outside the door. What's the big deal? We were just talking, she replied. Yes, yes, I see. I've been, as you say, for six months now. The woman shook her head. What am I going to do if he's so cute? Selena couldn't hide her feelings. Oh girl, be careful. Sam won't forgive you for this. She knew what she was saying. John will be free soon. He'll be gone and I'll follow him. The girl was sure of herself. Yes, yes, I believe you. Natalie pressed her lips together skeptically. I don't want to talk about this anymore. Selena looked away from the window, a smile playing on her face. With John, they were getting farther and farther away to talk quietly while they pretended to work. Will you come with me? The young man asked her. Not with you, but behind you, Celine said. Okay, I'll pass on the information. He took her by the chin with one hand, brought her close to him and looked into her eyes. Selena wanted him to kiss her so badly in those moments, but John didn't. Afterward, they said their goodbyes, not wanting anyone to see them together. He had less than six months to stay here. Sam, can't you see we've become strangers? Selena asked her husband at home, what do you want? He was already regretting taking such a young girl. Yes, to brag in front of friends that there is such a beauty, but she was not good for anything else. Divorce, it was scary, but she said the word. Okay, but don't regret it, he squinted. I won't thanks, she didn't look at him. What, you've been hitting on a convict? He'd suspected it for years, he'd been told, but he didn't believe it. It's none of your business, she purposely didn't bring it up while John was here. Now that he's gone, she could have said something. Yeah, it's not my business anymore, he came very close to her. Inside Selena, everything trembled with fear. She could seen how cruel her husband could be to prisoners. Don't, she closed her eyes. Scum, he leaned over her ear and pushed away from her a little. Selena waited to see if there would be a sequel, but Sam got dressed and left the house. She didn't wait for anything at this point, grabbed her bag, which had been ready for a while now, found her papers, waited a bit and left the apartment. To the train station, she said to the driver of the car. Good, he only nodded. Selena sat on the train, looked out the window, and thought that everything in life should be tried. And now she was going to her lover, where no one would stop them from being together. Selena saw him from the window. He was so beautiful standing on the platform, flowers in his hands. John, how did you know I was coming? She ran out to meet him. Coming to the trains waiting, he pressed her against him. Selena was smiling with her mouth full, she was happy. Now we'll go to my friend's apartment, and then there will be our own, the young man told her. Don't you have a place to live? She was surprised, but her eyes had rose-colored glasses again. Love overshadowed everything. I told you, for now, temporarily, he said in a rough voice. Okay, okay, I get it. She stretched her lips in a smile again. John's friend was out of town at the moment, so for a while, they could stay at his apartment alone. Are you glad I'm here with you? She twirled around the room. And you? He was looking through his notebook. Why do you ask? You know I'd do anything for you. She sat down next to him. I'm glad to, 
He took her chin in his hand as before, pulling her to him. Selena looked into his eyes and then closed her own. And at that moment, John kissed her. It was their first kiss. Are we getting married? She asked him at night as they lay in bed together. You're so naive. He turned his head toward her and kissed her nose. What do you mean? She lifted herself up and lay on his chest. Of course we'll get married since we have such love. John spoke as if he was laughing at her. The guy went out every morning, came back late at night. Selena wasn't bored. The apartment was such a mess. She wanted to put the place in perfect order. She cooked different dishes, waited for her lover to come home, and he came. The girl thought that's what life is like for two lovers. Where are you? He came home. I. She came out into the hallway, wearing a simple but beautiful dress. What smells so good? He sniffed. Your favorite dish, she looked puzzled. After that they would walk to the kitchen. There the hostess would feed her favorite man. Selena never asked John what he did for a living. She would never have believed he was back on the slippery slope. The man was bringing home money, which meant he was working somewhere. Selena was happy. Sometimes she wanted to call her parents. But then she changed her mind. She wanted them to think she was living with Sam. So, are you ready? John asked her one Saturday. For what? She didn't understand. To go to the registry office, he pulled out a simple wedding ring. John, I've been waiting. She went to her room to change. After that, they went to the government office where they were told that they were husband and wife from now on. I am the happiest man on earth, shouted John that day. He invited some friends. They were sitting at some cottage which was near a lake. Bro, congratulations. They shook hands with him. Today, he showed his beloved for the first time to those he trusted as himself. Do you want me to bake a cake tomorrow? Come to us, Celine told them. She wanted everyone to like her. Of course, if the landlord says yes, the young men laughed. John, she looked at her husband. Why me, if they want, let them come. He looked at his friends. From that moment, Celine was once again a happy wife. She knew that her man was the nicest, he would never do anything wrong. And most importantly, she could rely on him. Have you thought about children? He asked her in the evening. Why do you ask? Of course she wanted to, but she didn't want to say it. Let it go on as it was. Just in case you don't want it yet, he admitted and lay on his back. I do. She rested her chin on his chest. A boy will be born. I'll teach him everything. He'll be like daddy. He put his hand on her back. Come on, but not everything, she smiled, and he immediately understood what she meant. Selena, listen, I will do everything to make you and our future children happy. After these words, the young husband and wife fell asleep. In the morning, as promised, she got up and put the doll, immediately remembered her mother. It was she who taught her to do this. When she peeled the potatoes, she heard her husband wake up. He went to the bathroom. God, what a divine smell. He went to the kitchen. Wait, it's not ready yet. She laughed and slapped his hands. Where are your friends? Even if they don't come, I'll eat everything myself. He sat down on a chair and waited. There was a knock on the door and Oliver stood on the threshold. Hi, I'm here for the pie, as agreed. He entered the apartment. Can you feel it? John raised a finger in the air. You bet, it smelled like that already in the yard. They went together to the place where Selena was working her magic. Hello. She said hello to her husband's friend, whom she saw for the second time today. What an officious thing to say, hello. He walked over to her and shook her hand lightly. Good. She was not used to all this. Ten minutes later, they were already sitting at the table eating a delicious fresh pie. Where are the others? Selena looked at her friends. I don't know, they probably couldn't. Both of them had their mouths full of pie. All right, you'll get more. She cut them each another slice. When John and Oliver went into the room, Selena was clearing the table and washing the dishes. She didn't mean to, it came out by accident. 
but she overheard the conversation between the two companions. Did you find out? John asked Oliver. No, Oliver had to go, they spoke in a low voice. At first Celine wanted to just come in, but when she heard the next frog, she didn't dare. When he comes to visit, we have to vacate the house, because we live here illegally, her husband said. Listen, what are you sweating about? Everything will be fine, I'll make a deal, Oliver promised him. Selena went back to the kitchen, there she sat down on a stool, thinking, what if John was back in crime? But as soon as those thoughts crossed her mind, she dismissed them immediately. She didn't want to think bad thoughts. She hadn't heard the beginning of the conversation, and what if it wasn't what she thought it was? Selena, why are you sitting here? Oliver came into the kitchen. What? No, I was just thinking, she was confused. After that, they all went into the hall together. Family life went on. John said that they had to change the apartment. Selena was regretting to part with the nest, which was the first of them with John. Don't feel bad. We'll have our own soon. He pressed Selena against him. The young man did not get know that his wife was carrying a child under her heart. She didn't tell him. She wanted to come do everything, set the table, and then tell me, why are you looking so mysteriously and silent? He saw in the evening how tired his wife was, but she still prepared everything. Soon you will have a son, Selena was very calm. How did you know it was a son? He didn't understand. You want an heir, so you will have a son. She put her hands on her stomach. Beloved, he smiled. From that very evening, the young man began to bring home everything that might be needed in the upbringing of a child. What's all this for? Looked Selena surprised. There was already a crib, a stroller, a bunch of stuff, bottles, nipples, and everything else in the apartment. In case something happens to me, he averted his eyes. What could happen? She didn't finish, she stopped talking. Are you sick? He became agitated. Tell me the truth, where is all this money coming from? Only now she realized that he doesn't work anywhere, but he has money. I don't think you need to know that, he didn't say anything. John, you're doing it again. She wanted to cry, but at that moment he came to her and hugged her. It's going to be okay, he whispered in her ear. He didn't want her to worry. For the rest of the day, Selena passed quietly. She saw that her husband hadn't stopped anything, but she tried not to think about it so she wouldn't worry. Selena, why don't you go to the hospital? Pulled back the curtain and looked down John. What's going on? She wanted to look too. Nothing, just seeing what the weather was like, he turned to her. It was too early to go to the hospital. The due date was almost three weeks away. What if it started sooner? He tried to talk her into it. If you tell me the truth, then maybe I'll go. She stood with her arms at her sides. There's no truth. I'm just worried about you. He averted his eyes again. Then it's okay. I'll go to the hospital in two weeks. She sat down on the couch. Good. Her husband agreed with her. Selena saw how nervous he was every day pacing back and forth in the apartment, asking questions, but as always, John just kept quiet. When it was a week before the doctor's due date, Selena went to the hospital herself, as promised. Ouch, 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 it hurt, but she didn't scream. Ori, it will be easier, the neighbor advised. No, Selena stood bent over. Shall I call a doctor? She got up from the bed. Yes. The girl barely breathed out. A nurse came running. They went together to the labor room. How Selena was scolded there, that she tolerated so long and did not say anything to anyone. But other than that, everything went well. Thank you. John shouted as the doors of the hospital opened and a package with a blue bow was brought out. Home? The wife asked. Yes, only I've rented another apartment. He didn't let her ask or say anything covered her mouth with a kiss, and then Selena herself didn't remember what she wanted to ask. They arrived in the new neighborhood. She walked into the apartment and was surprised. Everything that had been lying in a big pile in the old apartment was now disassembled. The crib stood packed, all the things in the dresser. 
Did you do all this yourself? The young mother marveled. Oliver, and I did, smiled the husband. He spent all day with his son, as if he was afraid of losing him. Put him down for a minute. Selena wanted him to pay attention to her too. Look, he's smiling at me, John said. Don't make it up. He can't do that yet. Selena walked over and Oliver was indeed lying there, smiling. I am the luckiest woman, she said. Lately, Selena had been worried about not being able to tell her parents that she had a baby. What would she tell them? Sorry for lying to you for so long. No, she couldn't. Tom was six months old when John came home late at night. Selena woke up when he slammed the door. She expected John to come into the room, but he wasn't there. Where are you? It became scary to the girl that it might not have been her husband. Here, he moaned. Selena immediately jumped out of bed, ran out into the hallway. John was there half sitting, half lying down. What? She leaned over him and saw that he was covered in something red. She realized it immediately, started unbuttoning it. Stay out of it, her husband rudely pushed her away. You need help, she sat down beside him. It's okay, he wrinkled his nose. I can see it's nothing normal. She went to the kitchen, got the first aid kit, brought it out, and handed it to her husband. I'm sorry, I could hear him breathing heavily. And in the morning, the police arrived. Selena had been expecting it, so she wasn't really surprised. John was almost unconscious when they took him away. She never knew what had happened to him. Sleep, son, she sat up and stroked the baby on his back. Tears ran down her cheeks. He had never listened to her. He had started all over again, even though he had promised that nothing like that would happen again. Selena was scared. What if someone came to her? What would she do then? She had a small child in her arms. Every night when it got dark, she shut the windows and kept the lights off. She took Tom in her arms and sat there until the baby fell asleep. Then she lay down herself. Mommy, hello. She decided to make this call. Daughter, where have you been? The woman spoke excitedly. Everything is fine. I'm happy. I have a son was born. You and daddy are now grandparents, said Selena in a joyful voice, so as not to show it how scared she was. Do you want me to come to you? Where are you now? Her mother asked. No, it's okay. We'll come to you ourselves, promised the daughter. Before she dialed the number, she thought she would talk to her parents now and then go to them. But if John had ill wishes, wouldn't they know where her mom lived? And just as she was talking, the thought struck her. Selena sat staring at the phone. She didn't know who to call. She had no relatives or friends in this town. Oliver. She even jumped up from the couch. Selena walked over to the nightstand where the phone stood. John's address book was always lying there. She never opened it, but he looked at the phones there. Oliver. She dialed the number quickly, but there were only long beeps. Selena sighed and hung up. But an hour later, she dialed the young man's number again, and then again and again, but no one answered. Oliver, where are you? She said into the void. A month later, Oliver called. Hello, he seemed to be listening to her mood. Oliver, where have you been? She screamed into the phone. Can I come over? He spoke quickly. Of course, she cried. They didn't speak again on the phone. Half an hour later, the young man was at her house. What happened? Where is John now? What has he done? She beat his chest with her fists and cried. Calm down, somehow, I'll tell you everything. He led her into the kitchen so that the child would not see how the mother was behaving. How can I calm down when this has happened, sitting here, locked up, not showing my nose to the street? She was still crying. You're doing the right thing, Oliver, just as John had done, went to the window and looked down. Who's there? Selena yelled. No one, he turned to her. What are you looking at then? She couldn't help but scream. Selena, please calm down, let's talk coldly. He took her by the shoulders. Now she went and washed her face. She returned to the kitchen already without tears, but her voice was still shaking. 
John's in a bad situation. I won't say what kind of situation. Less you know, more you sleep. But you need to get out of here for a while. He sat in front of her, holding her hands. Where to? She didn't understand. I rented an apartment in the village next door. I need to live there for a while. He tried to look into her eyes. Alone. She looked at him blankly. Why alone with Tony? You want me to come over? He spoke very coldly. Okay. Selena felt like she didn't have a life anymore. Not having someone around to support and help. Then get ready. He went to the window again. The girl gathered her things and her son. Turned to Oliver. Ready? He could see that she wasn't herself. Maybe because of the tantrum she'd had recently. Yes. She looked at her son. The young man had him in his arms. Let's go then. They went down to the street, got into a car that was parked around the corner and drove off. Oliver brought her to where he said he would. There was a small house there. From the outside it seemed unremarkable, like so many others. But inside, everything was just as it should be. Darling, you have to live here for a little while. A year. A year and a half. He sat down in front of her again, looked into her face and spoke. Wow, a little while, she grinned. I'll be there for you, I promise. He stood up and pulled her against him, just like John always did. Okay, is there groceries here? She looked up. Yes, Oliver led her into the kitchen. He opened the refrigerator and all the cabinets. Wow, were you preparing for war? Selena saw that those were bursting with cereal, canned goods and other food. You don't need to go out yet. He pressed his finger to his lips. I realized she was no longer as confused as she had seemed before. Stay then, and I'll go, I'll be right there. He kissed her cheek and walked out of the cabin. Solana closed the doors and went to settle into her new home. Apparently, the place had been cleaned recently because everywhere was clean. Then Solana decided to make something to eat. She turned around and saw Tom crawling towards her. The boy was making attempts to get up and was already doing so against the wall. The house had everything she needed to live, so Selena didn't need to go out and she didn't want to. When a picture of John came into view, Selena would cry so hard you'd think her husband was dead. But she couldn't help it. Three weeks passed, there was a knock on the door. Her heart began to pound frantically in her chest. Who is it? She came over. Selena, it's me, Oliver, answered the guest. Startled, she opened. I'm sorry I've been gone so long. You're probably out of groceries too. He brought several large bags inside. I've got enough for another year, she laughed. I see you're feeling better, he smiled too. Yes, I started knitting. You know how soothing it is. She showed him the different products. While she was learning, so it was mostly scarves. You should definitely get one. He tried to encourage her again. Stop doing that. You don't have to. She gave him a palm on the shoulder. It's okay. John was my friend. Oliver continued to do something and Selena froze. Why was he? She stared at him point blank. No, it's okay. It's just, he's not around right now, he realized. Tell me the truth. They took him away. He was unconscious, Selena mumbled. Why would you do that? He wouldn't want you to know that, Oliver lowered his eyes. Tell me, she insisted. Your husband will probably go to jail, and the sentence will be a decent one. The young man exhaled. I knew it. She covered her face, but for some reason she didn't want to cry. Selena, it's going to be okay. He put his arm around her shoulders. Yes, I know. She took his hand and pulled it away. I'm sorry. He was embarrassed. After that, Oliver started coming almost every day. He brought Selena flowers, paid his respects, gave Tom gifts. What's all this for? She asked him. I like you. Why ruin your youth? The young man did not hide anything. Oliver, I cannot. I have John. She turned away from him because as a friend he suited her. But lately she noticed that he does not behave quite so. So what? You're going to go and become the boss's wife again. He sat down on the couch. What? She made big eyes. You thought he hadn't told anyone, grinned the guest. 
No, she tilted her head. How much she didn't know about her husband. Did he write you any letters? He asked another question. No, she shook her head. Did you? As if there was an interrogation going on. No, she said quietly. What was there to talk about then? Oliver was very sure. Still, you're his friend. Selene couldn't go for such a betrayal. They stayed in that settlement for exactly eight months. After that, Oliver said, everything calmed down. And when Selena returned to the apartment, which, as it turned out, her husband had bought while she was in the hospital, and he'd put it in Selena's name. So he must have known there'd be trouble. That's when she realized that it would be difficult to live alone. Her husband used to provide for her. Then when she was in the village, Oliver, and now, hi, he called her, how are you? Good, will you come over? Now Selena wondered what Oliver would think of her. Yes, he would, he was ready to rush to her at a moment's notice. She'd arranged a romantic dinner for them that night. Hey, come on in, I'll put Tom to bed and then I'll be there. She whispered to Oliver when she opened the door. Okay, he also replied. Selena was in the kitchen in a few minutes. Is today some kind of holiday? The young man asked. No, I just wanted to sit with you and talk. She was shy. By candlelight? He raised an eyebrow. Why not? Let it be romantic if there was a light on. He would notice her cheeks flaming. Okay. Oliver opened the sparkling wine, pouring it into glasses. They took a sip each, silent. The young man looked at the girl. He liked her very much. Do you know when I noticed you? He asked. No, her cheeks never stopped burning. Then, at the dacha, after your wedding, I could not understand how a brutal man like John could seduce someone like you. He took her hand. Why couldn't he? Selena didn't understand. I don't know. You're so delicate, so vulnerable. He kissed her palm. Oliver, do you think it's right? She meant their relationship. I think John will understand. He pulled his chair closer to hers. I'm kind of uncomfortable, Selena said shyly. It's okay, I'm not rushing things. We need a divorce first, and then we'll see what we do. He averted his eyes. I didn't think it would be necessary to get a divorce. She got up from her chair. You don't want to legitimize the relationship in the future, was surprised Oliver. I don't know, it seemed like the evening had been ruined by all this talk. Okay, come here. You don't need to think about that right now. He pulled Selena to him and sat her on his lap. Oliver came to Selena every day now. At first, it was just kisses and hugs. After six months, they were a full-fledged family. Dad, Tom ran up to Oliver. Selena, she was looking at the girl. If you don't mind, I don't mind either, said the one. Of course, he lifted the boy on his knees. They looked at something in a book. You still haven't decided to get a divorce? He asked her once. Look, do you feel that bad? She didn't understand it. Sometimes at night, Selena wondered why John didn't write to her. On the one hand, she understood him. Perhaps he didn't want his wife and son to worry. But on the other hand, she knew everything about him. Why not write? She would be supportive. No, it was okay. Oliver had said so, but it wasn't true. He didn't want to fight, so he didn't insist on anything. Now that they were living together, Selena could see that Oliver, just like John had once done, was leaving home. He had plenty of money, but not enough for anything. Oliver, tell me the truth, they had breakfast. Why would you do that? He poured coffee for himself and her. I don't want it to turn out like it did with John. I just, I won't get over it. She was telling the truth. I promise you I'll never leave you. And if anything bad happens, I'll always come to your rescue. He kissed her. I believe you. She nuzzled her cheek against his. Tom went to daycare. He came in bruised all the time. What happened again? Selena asked her son. Why are they teasing me? Frowned the boy. What do they say? The mother was curious. That my daddy is in jail. He folded his arms across his chest. You see, there's your daddy at home. Why believe in other people's gossip? She pointed at Oliver. 
He didn't interfere with her upbringing, afraid he'd do something wrong. When Tom's kindergarten graduation was in September and he had to go to school, Selena decided to go to her parents. Are you coming with us? She asked Oliver. If you'll take me, he teased Tom. Sure, what are you asking? She walked over to them. They planned when it would be after that Selena called her parents so it wouldn't be spontaneous. Oh my God, daughter, it's been years. Selena heard her mom crying. Over the weekend, they got in the car as a family and drove. Oliver, can I ask you something? The girl turned to him. Sure, why do you ask? He put his hand on her knee. Mom will ask a lot of questions. She doesn't know who I left with or where I went. She can only assume. So let's just say you were the husband after Sam. If we don't imagine the questions, she said, staring straight ahead. Of course we will. He agreed with her. When they drove up to the house where the girl lived, tears came to her eyes. Honey, what are you doing? Oliver looked at his beloved. I don't know, nostalgia or something, she shrugged. Mom, who lives here? My son asked from the back seat. Grandma, she turned to kiss him, but he turned away. I'm not little anymore, he told her. Come on, let's go. She got out of the car and helped Tom out. Oliver got everything out of the trunk, and they headed for the driveway. Who's there? I heard it from behind the door. Mom, Selena said. Daughter, the woman opened the door and froze. She didn't know who to hug first, but she pressed the girl against her. Hi, Grandma, Tom said. How big you are already? She leaned over and hugged him too. Hello, it was Oliver's turn to give the woman anyone who remembers the past is... He didn't finish. Okay, understood. Laughed the girl and sat down at the table. It had been so long since they'd seen each other that they'd done nothing but talk and talk. Oliver and his father went out on the balcony a few times, and the mother and daughter kept chattering like magpies. At some point, Tom got tired of it and went to bed, and the women cleared the table and sat in the kitchen for a long time. Oh, Selena, I didn't think you'd have such a life, said her mother, folding her arms across her chest, and she didn't know the whole truth. It's okay, you don't have to worry, her daughter reassured her. And now I see that you're doing well, so there's nothing to worry about, you just come to visit, or bring Tom, they hugged again, for the hundredth time that evening. It was a good time, driving back. Yeah, your parents are great, Oliver agreed. Am I still going to grandma's? Shouted Tom. Sure, laughed the parents. They were home, all was well. Oliver went out, as before, and came back sometimes at night, sometimes in the morning, but Selena didn't say anything to him. As long as he didn't come back like John had, she thought about it all the time. Are you ready? Oliver came into the room, he had to go to the lineup. Yes, shouted the son and mom. Today, everyone was happy and cheerful, and in the evening, the man invited the family to a restaurant. The first class went quickly, it was difficult, but Tom tried. In the summer, he asked to go to his grandmother, that's where they sent him. And Oliver and Selena flew south, to the sea. Everything was good in the family, no one ever fought, everyone loved each other. Sometimes Selena looked at her son and saw John in him. She never told him about his own father, she thought. That the time would come, he would ask, and she would tell. Every summer, the boy went to his grandmother's house, and she loved him. Until the fifth grade, Tom generally loved it, and then began to be capricious. Mother and father did not insist on the fact that he must necessarily spend the whole summer at his grandmother's house and may go for a month. The boy agreed to such a compromise. This morning, he had to go to the lineup. Tom was already in seventh grade. Did Oliver call? His mother shouted from the room. No, the son answered her. Strange, he could not miss such a thing, could not understand where he was Selena. It's okay, we'll go alone, approached her son. How mature you are, she kissed him on the top of his head. Selena put on shoes, the guy's shoes, he took his backpack, mom flowers, 
they left the apartment. It wasn't that far to school, so they got there quickly. That's it, don't go any further. The boy stopped near the gate. What's wrong? Mom made a surprised face. Mom, I'm going to the seventh grade, not the first. He looked serious. Okay, go, she saw her parents standing there. Oliver never showed up for the lineup, and he wasn't home that evening either. Selena was nervous. She called him, but his phone was unavailable. Oliver, please call or answer, she asked, looking at the phone. But he was silent. A month passed. The man never returned. Selena was afraid to contact the authorities because the man was connected to crime. She was beginning to think that the same thing had happened to her husband. Mom, why are you so sad? Tom came up to her. They were preparing for the new year. Where is Oliver? Why isn't he with us? She looked at the tree she wanted to decorate. Let's go outside, go to the square. Look at the big slide, the lights, Tom called her. Let's go, Selena waved her hand. Why should she suffer when she had a son who didn't need her decadent mood? They left the apartment and just as she was about to close the door, someone shoved her back in. Mom, Tom shouted. The door closed in his face and he was left on the landing. You weren't expecting me. Selena saw John's angry face. What are you doing here? She tried to get out of his arms. I came home, and here my wife is living the good life, he grinned. What are you talking about? Her eyes were big with terror. Are you afraid? He laughed. John, you're insane. Her voice trembled. Okay, Louv. He pushed her away, then opened the door. The guy had been chiseling at her the whole time. Who are you? He ran into the apartment and saw his mom lying on the floor. Tom, it's me, your dad, he said in a completely different voice. What? He looked at the woman and the man. Yes, Tom, it's true. He's your real dad, Selena confirmed. You told me. The boy stopped talking. John walked over to his wife. He lifted her off the floor with one tug. So, Selena, is dinner ready? Husband's back from prison, he said with a smear. Yes, now, she went to the kitchen on woozy legs. There were so many thoughts in her head that she could not grasp any of them. The woman decided to act casual, as if nothing had happened. She heated up what had been prepared, put it on plates, and called her husband over. Oh, wow, royal. He rubbed his hands together and sat down. Why are you acting like this? She sat down across from him. How? He started chewing. Like it's my fault. She was picking at her salad with her fork. Who's to blame me? He looked up at her. You came that night. You didn't explain anything. Then they took you away. What was I to think? Why didn't you write? Selena cried. What could I explain to you? Everything was said to Oliver, who then took you away. Anger began to appear in her voice again. John, I was hurting, and I was also scared and Oliver helped me. She tried to tell everything so that he wouldn't get angry again. You'd think I was having fun out there. He snorted and continued eating. What are you going to do now? She forced herself to ask the question. Nothing, I'm back with my family. Now we'll live like before, he smiled. Do you think we can do it like we used to? It was all a flame inside. Why not? He raised his eyebrows as if he was surprised. John, I'm sorry. I didn't know what to do. I was just a weak woman with a child in my arms. So I gave in to temptation. She chose a different tactic. That's it. I'm back. Now the family is reunited. We'll live. Raise our son. He looked in the corridor. The boy was nowhere to be found. Good, smiled Selena. She thought that it is not worth to inflame the situation. Time will pass, everything will be solved by itself. And where is your new boyfriend? The man froze, waiting for an answer. I do not know. It was the truth. That's good. He's gone. He probably knew I'd be back. John laughed. That night, Selena asked her husband if he would let her sleep with her son. He agreed, but just for that night. Mom, whispered Tom when they had already turned out the light. What? She realized the boy had a lot of questions. What's going to happen to us now? She could hear his voice shaking. 
everything will be fine. She stroked her son's head. In the morning, the woman hurried to get up early to make breakfast. She didn't want to make anyone nervous. How wonderful it is, got up. And here everything is already ready. Her husband came to the kitchen. No need, she didn't turn to him. Selena is mine. He came over and hugged her from behind. What are you doing? Tom will say, she tried to push him away. Don't you dare try anything else, he said angrily, right in her face. I got it. She turned her back to the stove again. Selena cried quietly as John kissed her neck. I woke up and washed my face. Tom walked into the kitchen. Ah, favorite son, John turned to the boy. Don't come near me, said the lad angrily. He saw the marks the man's fingers had left on his mother's neck. Why are you being so mean to me? His father thrust himself at him. Stop it, shouted Selena. Okay, I'm just kidding. Why are you starting? He immediately changed his mood, sitting down at the table. It went on like this all day. And at night, John grabbed her arm as she went to Tom's room. Where are you going? My husband missed you. He pulled her to him. You've been gone practically 13 years. I need to get used to it. She looked him in the eye, thinking it would make him feel better. But it didn't work. He just threw her on the bed. Selena just prayed that her son wouldn't walk in at this point. After all that, the man just turned away and snored. Selena went to the bathroom. She sat there for a couple hours. After that, she came out and headed to Tom. Mom, did he hit you in there? Her son asked. No, it's okay. She pulled him close to her. That night, the woman thought that next time she would call the police and they would take him away. And then came the thought of if she didn't make it in time, then what would he do to them? This morning, Selena could see that he had no pity for anyone, not her or her son. John, it's New Year's Eve. Come on, you're not going to act like this. She asked him this morning at breakfast. Okay, if you're going to be a goody two-shoes, he smiled at her again. Selena thought that he must have been beaten up, and now something has happened to his head. That's why he's acting like that. Tom, let's go decorate the Christmas tree, called out to her son's mother after dinner. It had been standing in their room like that since that evening. All right, ran the boy over to his mother. Joan hadn't been home all day. It was such a relief. Mom, why don't you complain to Grandma? Asked Tom. What are you doing? You can't do that under any circumstances. She will get very upset. Mom pressed her finger to her lips. Okay, but how long are we going to put up with this? He took the toy, and when he didn't hear the answer, he turned to his mom. Son, I'm sorry, I don't know, she cried. Why doesn't Oliver come to us? Is he afraid of him too? The boy didn't understand. I think something happened to him. She wiped away her tears. Was it his fault too? That's all my son ever called John. You know what I thought of? Let's pack our things. I have money, rent an apartment, and move out of his place. Selena's eyes widened. Why didn't she say anything when he left this morning? Tom rushed to his room. But they didn't have time to do anything. Her husband and father came home. He wasn't quite himself. Oh, family, he hiccuped. You need to get some sleep, Selena asked him. Okay, just with you. He took her hand and they went to the couch. Tom felt so bad for his mother and also that he couldn't do anything about it. John plopped down on the bed and pulled Selena with him. She didn't resist. He was in such a state that he fell asleep immediately. She lay there for a little longer and then went back to her son. No, Tom, we are not going anywhere with you. He will find us everywhere and it will be worse there. She hugged him. He won't kill you. That was a mother's worst question. I hope not, she thought to herself. She had made such a life for herself. In the evening, Selena and Tom sat at the table, waiting for the chimes to strike, just in time for the head of the family to wake up. Okay, I'll sit with you, he said in a hoarse voice. Selena poured champagne for herself and him, and Tom had a splash of soda. At the sound of the clock, John raised his glass, winked at his wife and drank. After that, he went back to bed. 
The woman and the boy exhaled with relief. The New Year's vacation passed more or less quietly. John was celebrating all these days, so he didn't care about anyone. He just sat in the kitchen for a while and then slept. Selena and Tom went out unhindered, walking around, coming back. I wish he was dead. They went into the driveway one day. Son, you can't say that, his mother whispered to him. Can you do that to us? He almost cried, though he hadn't done it for a long time. Quiet. She was so used to that word that she said it all the time. They entered the apartment. It was quiet. Selena went into Tom's room. They spent most of their time there now. I'm hungry, her son showed her. Now, she said with just her lips. Selena left the room and went to the kitchen. Where have you been? Stoughton staggered her husband in the hallway. John, please go get some sleep. She put her hands together. What? He wailed throughout the house. Please, Selena cried. What are you asking me to do? He wrinkled his nose. For you to leave me and Tom alone, she turned around. Her son was in the room. Fuck you. He kicked her and she flew off, hitting the wall. You touch her. Tom saw everything. He felt so sorry for his mom. He stood there clenching his fists, but he couldn't do anything because he was afraid of him. Go to your room before you get it yelled his father at him. After that, he just walked over his wife, went to the kitchen, and then went back to sleep. Mommy, whispered Tom. Sonny, she's come to her senses. I'm going to call the police now. He was ready to do it. No, you don't have to. She managed to get up. She was dizzy. After that, Selena lay down on the bed. Her son brought a wet towel. She put it on her head. I promise you, we will leave tomorrow. She couldn't put herself and her son in any more danger. I believe you, mommy. He leaned on her chest and cried. It's okay, honey. Everything will be fine. It can't go black all the time. Tears were flowing from her eyes. She didn't want to show them to her child. That afternoon, Selena installed a bolt in Tom's room that she had taken off the toilet door. Do you think it will help us? The child doubted it. I don't know, maybe Selena wasn't sure about it herself, but at least there was some protection. At night, Selena counted the money she had, enough to rent an apartment for a few months. She packed a bag where she put the essentials for herself and her son. There were also documents. Then she went to her room, closed the door, and sat down in a chair. Mom, why don't you go to bed? Tom asked. I can't. I have a headache, she said. During the night, Selena heard John get up, but he didn't even come to their door. When Tom's alarm clock went off, she flinched. Tom, get up, she pushed her son. They got dressed in the room, and when they were in the hallway, John came out. Where are you going? He leaned on the door jamb. Selena looked at him, trying to determine what state he was in. For a walk, she said, and smiled. Again? not having a walk. He grabbed her by the cloak. Let mama go, Tom shouted. And you shut up in general, don't take me out, or it will be worse, he made big eyes and looked at his son. Tom ran off, as everyone thought, to his room. John, let go, Selena asked. She thought these angry outbursts would just come and go. Why do you keep telling me to let go, let go, let go, come on? He lifted her off the floor and threw her. Ah, it hurt. Selena thought she even blacked out for a moment. Not enough, let go some more, he kicked her. Get away from her. The boy came out of the kitchen, a knife blade glinting in his hand. Ah, you, are you going to throw yourself at me? He winked at his son. At that moment, Selena regained consciousness. She swung the coat rack, which fell right on her husband. What, everyone is against me? He looked around. Son, go to the room and shut yourself in there. Tried to shout mother, but from the throat came out a kind of wheeze. You still don't get it. He went back to his wife. I said get away from her. Tom didn't move. He was ready to be attacked. Yeah, now I'll deal with her first and then you. Puppy, he shook his wife. No, Selena was hit. She closed her eyes. Tom ran at his father. 
He knocked the knife out of his hands and pushed the boy away. He flew to the door of the room. I'm going to make you dance. He went to his wife again because he thought the boy had nothing left to give. She didn't move, so John decided to take a break and go to the kitchen. He did just that. The mother opened her eyes, saw her son lying in the hallway, not moving. Tom. She started to call out to him, but he didn't move. What are you yelling about? John came up to her. You can't handle anyone else, just a woman and a child. She couldn't open her eyes fully. What do you know who and what can I do with? He was looming again. No, I think you're a coward and always have been. Selena saw her son had moved and was now creeping into his room. So she needed to distract the man. What, I've never been a coward. But Oliver is one, he spit on the floor. Do you know where he is? His wife asked him. Of course I do. He's the one who got me hurt. We came to the shooting. We didn't expect them to have guns. And when they started shooting, Oliver pulled out his gun. One, one, two, they hit the cars and it was like they were dead or alive. He yelled, Oliver, 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 and he was gone too. He told it all with such anger that the drawer was flying in different directions. It was clear now how many years he had kept this anger in himself, and now he decided to express it. Did you just make that up? Selena wanted to bring him out of his memories. Naturally, everything was pinned on me, and I, like a fool, did not turn myself in. I thought that my friend covered for me, and he started making out with my wife. The trial hadn't been held yet, and you were already together, and my eyes blowed. I was scared and he helped me, Selena screamed. It's about to get even scarier. He leaned over her, taking her by the chin, just like when she met him. John, please. She saw him swinging. She squeezed her eyes shut. What scared? He was mocking her. I never realized you had so much anger in you, Selena said with such contempt that she was disgusted. Do you know where your Oliver is? He was in her face. Where? She didn't think she was gonna hear anything good. The worms ate him a long time ago. No, I found him first, and we went to talk, and soon you'll be there with him. He put his hand around her neck, and Selena fainted again. John went to the kitchen. He noticed that Tom wasn't in the hallway. He wanted to go in and see him, but then he waved his hand. He wasn't going anywhere. Selena came to her senses, moaned, but called only her husband to her. That's it, let's go. He scooped her up. At this point, Tom heard it all, but he couldn't get up because he was under the bed. He just covered his eyes with his hands and cried. John was dragging Selena. She didn't have any strength to resist. She felt them go outside, and then he threw her into the car. No, not into the passenger compartment, but into the trunk. The woman felt her shoulder bump hard. Fia gripped every muscle, not only for herself, but for her son. He was alone. What would happen when John came back? God, please help Tom. May he be all right. She prayed quietly as the car moved. Selena felt her lips swell. She couldn't move them, she groaned. It was a long ride, and she dozed off because she was seasick and tired. She heard her husband's voice. He was carrying her again, but it must have been heavy, so he put her on the ground so that she could walk on her own. Selene felt the cold from the snow, but kept silent. She couldn't see anything with her eyes. Perhaps something had been thrown over her head. Forgive me, she whispered, lips unmoving. God will forgive, he pushed her ahead of him, Selena cried. She realized that now the man would stop at nothing. It's true what they say about those who have been to places not so far away, and then want to go back again. Please come to your senses, we have a little son. How will he be without us? He will be put in an orphanage, the woman asked. Why not without us? His mother is out partying and his father is at home, him get used to it. It was hard to walk, but John grinned. Selena realized that they were no longer in the city. There was a lot of snow. Her husband knew exactly where they were going or not, and he was driven by anger. Finally, they stopped. He pulled off what was on her head. 
Selene could see now that they were in a forest, with only white canvas and trees around them. What scared? He took her by the chin. Yes, she looked into his black eyes again. So you know, if someone hurts me, they end up like this. He pulled out a rope. What are you going to do? She squealed out of control. On the car ride, the woman still had some hope that John would come to his senses. He just wanted to scare her into being dependent on him. But now, she could see that this wasn't a joke at all. What do you think? He pushed her and she felt the wood. I'm just going to freeze out here, you monster, she cried. No, you won't freeze, you won't have time. The wolves will eat you before that. Believe me, I know there are plenty of them here. He went on with his business. You'll get it all back. She's out of arguments. Think of how much pain I've been in all these years. Selena thought John was smiling. So much pleasure it all gave him. You bastard. You said you loved me so much. And now what are you doing? Believe me, nothing good will come of this act for you. Even if I am eaten by wolves, I will not give you peace. I will torture you for the rest of your life. She shouted all this and it seemed to herself that she had already gone crazy. Yes, yes, be deceived. He had tied the knot. Help, she shouted it into the night sky. No one can hear you here. Even if you scream, for many kilometers there is no one and nothing. Only you and nature. He took her by the chin again. Save me, ah. Selena screamed as loud as she could. Shut up. He hit her. She passed out. Selena doesn't know how long she was unconscious. She woke up from the cold, her legs straight up with cramps, her own scream stuck in her throat. Help! She twisted her head around, but she couldn't say anything. The woman cried. She realized that her screams would not do any good, but would only make things worse. If there were any animals here that her husband had mentioned, they had already heard her. And now it was winter, most likely wolves at this time are very hungry and angry. Shoo, she began to hiss. Her lips were not listening. Not only were they abrasions, but the cold was so cold. She, get out of here. She felt the presence of someone, or maybe it was just her imagination. And then she saw the glint in his eyes. Her insides clenched. Selena imagined the pack attacking her now. The wolves were closing the circle. She remembered a phrase from a book, but she could only see two of them. And then she heard a whistle and thought she saw a light. Help, I'm here. She started to make some noises. Selena thought she was screaming very loudly, but in reality, it was just a croak coming from her throat. Selena saw the beast scurry away as another one appeared where she was. It sort of barked, but it did so in an unusual way. She stood, she felt like she was already somewhere not here, because that couldn't be the case. The beasts seemed to be fighting for prey. Selene. She heard Oliver's voice. At that moment, the woman thought that everything had already happened and she was gone. And she felt nothing, because it was very cold and so much adrenaline was released into the bloodstream. She lost consciousness again. Love. Remember I always told you I'd be there for you no matter what happened to you. She heard him through the fog. Oliver, she wanted to touch him, but at the last moment she pulled her hand away because she realized she was dreaming. Love, wake up. His voice was blurry and sounded far away. Selena felt warm, she groaned, then opened her eyes. She looked around. It was a house, log walls, whitewashed ceiling. John, she called out. She thought her torment continued. He had taken pity, untied her, and now he had brought her here. Selene, have you come to your senses? Oliver entered the room. It can't be. Am I dead or asleep? The woman pinched herself. She wanted to raise herself, but couldn't do it. Her legs hurt. Calm down. It's me. He crouched on the edge of the bed. She took his hand in hers pressed it to her cheek and sobbed. Apparently John's brains had atrophied so much that he'd decided to take everyone to the same place. He leaned over and kissed her hair. Where were you? Why didn't you come to us, protect us? She cried. 
her cheeks beginning to burn. I couldn't. But that's not the point. I need to rub you again. He touched the spot where her cheeks burned. What's wrong with me? She touched her hand where he had touched her cheeks. It hurt like a burn. Your face is a little frostbitten, but your legs are worse. Oliver pulled back the blanket and Selena looked at her limbs, which were red. Wow, a little. She leaned back on the pillow and the man started rubbing something greasy on her. Now let's get this done. You'll be good as new in a week, Oliver smiled. What's that? She wrinkled her nose and plugged it with her fingers. It's a super remedy, badger fat. It's a cure for everything. He showed her the jar, which had only a little left in it. Oliver, what are you doing here? How did you find me? She felt much better now that her feet and face were smeared. Selena, I'll tell you everything, but a little later, you're still weak, not ready. He put her back on the bed. Wolf, she made big eyes and looked somewhere behind Oliver. What? He turned around. There was indeed a wolf sitting on the doorstep, but it wasn't quite like that. I'm scared. She couldn't stop the terror from coming. Don't be afraid. It's Polkan. He made a gesture. The animal approached. Am I in a fairy tale? She looked at her man with big eyes. No, it's really a wolf, but a tame one. He patted it behind the ears. After that, Oliver left, but quickly returned, a tray with a bowl of porridge and tea in his hands. Selena felt like she hadn't eaten anything in a while. Dake. She took the spoon from his hands when he wanted to feed her himself. Let's do it yourself then. He nodded his head and sat down next to the bed. Tom, after the first spoonful, she suddenly looked up at the man. What? He stirred too. He stayed at home. Selena wanted to set her plate aside, but Oliver did not let her do it. I guess he won't be interested in the guy without you. He gestured for her to eat. God, how long will all this last? The porridge was very tasty. The woman ate everything, drank tea. Need to sleep. He helped her lie down and covered her with a blanket. We'll find him, won't we? She was talking about her son. Of course, don't even think about bad things. The man kissed her. In the evening, when Selena was much better, Oliver rubbed her again with badger fat. You're so thoughtful. She sat up in bed. Can you get up? He gave her a hand. Let's try, the woman agreed. Selena got to her feet, Oliver supporting her, and they walked out of the room and into the small kitchen. There was a stove, a table and carved benches. Do you like it? He sat her down on one of them. Very much, tell me all about it, she asked. Then, at the end of August, I went to buy Tom a gift for September 1. He began to recall and put the kettle on, began to arrange cups, saucers and cookies on the table. Well, why are you silent again? She waited for the continuation. I came to the store, got out of the car, and there was John. He appeared suddenly, so I was a little scared. Oliver realized that if Selena asked her husband something, he could tell her everything in a heartbeat. I had the same thing, she lowered her eyes. So we hugged. He said he'd recently gotten out, I congratulated him, and then we went to a cafe to celebrate, he was silent again. Is that hard for you to remember or what? She was worried about the man. We sat there until almost midnight, and then John asked to take him to one of the villages that were near the city. Oliver looked at the woman and smiled. He realized that everything he would tell her next would not please her very much. But you've been drinking, she made big eyes. Just a little bit. We left the place, got in the car, your husband looked normal, let's go. Oliver saw that the kettle was boiling, began to pour boiling water into cups. Well, enough with the stories at such long intervals, Selena asked him. She didn't want any more tea, only to know what happened to her beloved then. Well, he showed me the way, a head showed the forest, I was surprised. What village could be in the forest? But John assured me that now we will pass it, and there everything will be just. It is the shortest road. He sat down next to the woman he loved and took her hand. And you came to this forest? She guessed. Yeah, 
I don't know what John's connection to this place is. Maybe it's where they brought him in the 90s for a showdown. But the fact remains, he lowered his eyes. What did he do to you? Selena put her palms to her mouth. Asked me to stop was done. He got out of the car. I followed him. Then he shot me. Oliver didn't look her in the eye. How? It was horrible to even imagine it. In his legs, he lifted his pants. There was a scar on each leg. Beloved, she pressed herself against him. And then I did the same thing I did to you. But in your case, you would have either frozen or been eaten. I had a nasty bug that you can't get rid of, and it hurt like hell. I don't know how long I spent in there, delirious, awake and unconscious. But I was lucky Celine for he was crying. Just as I did, she kissed him. He probably agreed with her. And who rescued you? She was waiting for the rest. The local forester. He was here that week, in this very cabin. He had to get everything ready for winter, so he came. And Polkan, his own wolf, which he had tamed, had found me. What one man can do, she thought of her son again. Yeah, Grandpa Jacob got me here, and then he nursed me back to health. I was delirious for days. I thought I was somewhere else in the world. And the old man thought we were bandits, sorting things out here. And I got such a terrible execution, the man smiled. And then, why didn't you come back? She kept waiting for that answer. Afraid, Oliver didn't hide it. That's understandable. She turned away from the window, tears streaming from her eyes. I decided to live here for a while, let him think I was dead. So it would be easier for everyone. He didn't touch Selena, realizing that it wasn't easy for her either. Didn't you think about me? She asked the big question. Of course I did, every day. But first of all, I couldn't get up for a long time. And secondly, how could I help you? Because we're nobody to each other. He wanted to hold her against him so badly that he squeezed his eyes shut. Where is your grandfather Jacob now? She decided to change the subject. In the village, I guess, he shrugged. Okay, buddy, calm down, it's going to be okay. Grandpa walked into the kitchen. Selena sat looking at him. Hello, she said quietly. I see the frost didn't spare you. He pointed at his cheeks, which, apparently, were also frostbitten. Oliver is helping me. She looked at the jar of badger fat. That's right, that's good. He sat down on the edge of the bench. Grandpa Jacob, we have to get out of here. Selena's son is staying there, and he's been looking to the old man for support, as usual, for the last few months. I have transportation, he said slyly. Can you help me? Oliver was glad. Sure, the old man clapped himself on his knees. Come with me. They wake outside, went to where the wood pile was. When they were close, Oliver stopped. Well, what are you up to? The grandfather took one hand to the tarp that hung from the roof. Now, a man came up. They yanked it once, another, when it fell. Then in front of the men was something like a garage, only cold. Here it is, my dear, never let me down. Grandpa Jacob stroked the snowmobile. Where did he get all this good stuff? Oliver wondered. Grateful hunters, though not new, but on the move, he drove it from where it stood. All day, he and his grandfather worked on the machinery. They had to grease the chain, fill it with fuel, check if everything worked. When the old man was sure of everything, he told the guests to dress warmly. Neither of them had warm clothes. Grandpa had found and brought some for Oliver, but Selena was wrapped in what she had. Jacob took the wheel, then the woman got in, and Oliver followed in the back. Let's go, Grandpa shouted, and the snowmobile started off. Selena didn't realize where they were at all, and she couldn't see anything now. The snowmobile was kicking up clouds of snow that covered everything, eyes, nose, and mouth. She hid behind Jacob's grandfather, patient. Well, here we are. He drove them almost all the way to town. Thank you for everything. We'll see each other again. Oliver shook his hand. We promise, Selena supported him. Okay, buddy, calm down. It's going to be okay. Grandpa walked into the kitchen. 
Selena sat looking at him. Hello, she said quietly. I see the frost didn't spare you. He pointed at his cheeks, which, apparently, were also frostbitten. Oliver is helping me. She looked at the jar of badger fat. That's right, that's good. He sat down on the edge of the bench. Grandpa Jacob, we have to get out of here. Selena's son is staying there, and he's been looking to the old man for support, as usual, for the last few months. I have transportation, he said slyly. Can you help me? Oliver was glad. Sure, the old man clapped himself on his knees, come with me. They wake outside, went to where the wood pile was, when they were close, Oliver stopped. Well, what are you up to? The grandfather took one hand to the tarp that hung from the roof. Now, a man came up. They yanked it once, another, when it fell. Then in front of the men was something like a garage, only cold. Here it is, my dear, never let me down. Grandpa Jacob stroked the snowmobile. Where did he get all this good stuff? Oliver wondered. Grateful hunters, though not new, but on the move, he drove it from where it stood. All day, he and his grandfather worked on the machinery. They had to grease the chain, fill it with fuel, check if everything worked. When the old man was sure of everything, he told the guests to dress warmly. Neither of them had warm clothes. Grandpa had found and brought some for Oliver, but Selena was wrapped in what she had. Jacob took the wheel, then the woman got in, and Oliver followed in the back. Let's go, Grandpa shouted, and the snowmobile started off. Selena didn't realize where they were at all, and she couldn't see anything now. The snowmobile was kicking up clouds of snow that covered everything, eyes, nose, and mouth. She hid behind Jacob's grandfather, patient. Well, here we are. He drove them almost all the way to town. Thank you for everything. We'll see each other again. Oliver shook his hand. We promise, Selena supported him. Now it was necessary to get to the nearest branch. It was dangerous to go home. Hello. The woman approached one of the men in uniform who stood at the traffic police post, which the couple reached on foot. Zdorovi wish, the man said. He examined the woman. She was wearing such an outfit that she looked more like a hobo. She looked more like a vagrant rather than someone who needed real help. We need help. My husband took me into the woods and left me there. She didn't elaborate. It was in the 90s when they went there to bury everyone. The guy was young. He probably saw a lot of action movies, so he laughed at what he didn't know. Anyway, Oliver came up. We need a ride to the department. Can you give us a ride? Sure. He came up to his partner, said something, got behind the wheel of the car, and they drove off. It wasn't that close to the nearest apartment. When they stopped, they got out of the car, thanked the young man. Listen, how can we without documents? They will say that we are beggars. They will not let us in. And what's more, they will lock us up. Selena began to doubt. Let's go. Let's tell the whole truth. If they don't believe us, then we'll deal with it later. He took her hand. They went in. They were escorted to an office where they told everything, and when they saw that they were believed, they showed all their scars and wounds. The man who took them in said that immediate action would be taken. Now home, Selena hurried, for she still didn't know where her baby was. She hoped he was home, which she had warned the staff about, because John could be expected to do anything. She and Oliver made it safely to the yard where they had once lived. They were advised to sit in the neighbor's driveway. They were in a state that their own mother wouldn't recognize. So the couple did. They saw John being led out under their arms. Tom wasn't with them. Selena wanted to rush over to ask where her boy was, but Oliver held her back. We'll find him ourselves. He's a smart boy, he assured the woman. When they got into the apartment, the place was turned upside down. What was he looking for? The landlady couldn't understand. What do you mean? Money? Jewelry? Oliver came up to her. We need to think about where Tom might be. She looked up at him. Let's change first, he laughed. Yeah, Selena wasn't paying attention to what outfit she was wearing. How she looked. 
Right now, the important thing was different. They quickly found what they needed, now sitting in the kitchen, both of them with their phones in their hands. Call your parents, Oliver asked. No, he knew he couldn't go to them, that his grandmother would be nervous. She shook her head negatively. He had a scare. One woman he loved was taken away. He went to another, Oliver really thought. No, let's call his friends first. She started dialing the phones of his parents and the guys her son was friends with, but no one had seen him all this time. He couldn't have taken him somewhere too. The man looked at her. I don't even think about it. Maybe search the basements and attics. Selena threw out options. Are you sure? It was winter, so Oliver doubted very much that Tom could do that. No, she lowered her head. It'll be okay, give me the phone. He took her machine, dialed the number. Where are you calling from? She wanted to take the phone away from him, but it was already answered. Hello, how are you? Oliver was very polite. Yeah, we were coming to see you too. He smiled and looked at Selena. Well, see you later. He pressed the red button. Oliver, why? She looked at the phone screen where her mother's number was written. They have Tom, the man said coldly. What? She couldn't believe it was that simple. When I asked how things were going, your mother said she was baking cakes for her grandson, and as I understand it, she doesn't have any other grandchildren besides your son, right? He stood up and went into the room. You told her to call them right away, she cried. Nothing to shed tears. Get ready. Let's go. He was already waiting for her in the hallway. A few hours later, they were already going up to the floor where her parents lived. Selena was only afraid of one thing, if her son told his grandparents everything, how she would explain it all to them. She pressed the bell button. Who is it? And again that native voice. Mom open, pulled a smile on the woman's face. Hello dears, where have you been so long? And how could you send a child alone to us? It's winter outside, and what if something would have happened? From the doorstep began to reprimand the mother. Selena realized that Tom had lied to her grandmother. She was happy that he had listened to her and done the right thing. Mom, he ran out into the hallway. Hi, Oliver held out his hand, but Tom didn't even pay attention to him. Son, come on, that's our Oliver, she asked. It's all his fault. Did you hear what he said? He didn't want to talk. Honey, everything happened as it happened. There's nothing you can do about it now. You have to move on. Oliver helped me. He loves us. Selena realized that she was standing there talking to her son. She waited a little longer and then thought that time would pass. Things would get better again. Together they all walked to the room where grandma was cutting a cake. They had tea. And when the women were in the kitchen, the mother looked sternly at her daughter. Who is this one? She repeated her grandson's words. Mom, it didn't matter anymore. Celine didn't want the woman to know about such a shameful moment in her life. Daughter, we have always been close to you. Why won't you tell me? Her mother turned her to face her and ran her hand over her cheek, which had recently stopped hurting. Mom, it's over now. Everything will be okay now, Selena hugged her. Okay, I hope someday you'll tell me all this. A tear rolled down her cheek. The woman saw how her grandson came to her. It was winter, and he was wearing sneakers and a windbreaker. There was a bruise on his cheekbone. At first, she wanted to sound the alarm, thought Oliver might have done it. But when the boy told her that his mom and dad had sent him alone to his grandmother's house, she didn't ask too many questions. She wanted to bide her time. She realized that something terrible had happened, but since her daughter did not tell her anything, she decided not to bother her with questions. The family went home. The apartment needed a lot of redecorating because John had broken everything. Maybe we should sell this apartment with so many bad reminders? Oliver asked her. I was thinking the same thing but let's wait a little while for things to settle down, she asked him. I hope you won't mind divorcing that bastard now. They stood in the hallway and hugged. Of course not, she kissed his chin. I was so afraid of losing you, he almost cried. 
I will always be with you. Selena realized that here he was, her true and only man. Will you marry me? He knew the answer, but still, he wanted to hear it. Yes, she felt that they were already connected, but that wasn't enough for her. John was taken into custody. Selena and Oliver detailed everything he'd done. Jacob's grandfather was a witness. At the trial, the man had been declared insane, and it had been decided that he should be evaluated in a mental institution. What did he accomplish? Oliver grinned when he and Selena got home. Everything was fine now. The man and woman had sold the apartment where they'd once lived, and now they were looking for a new place to live. Dad, I'm sorry. Tom came to him. It's been a year since they met at Grandma's. He hugged the boy. Selena got in. She studied by correspondence, and in the meantime, she had time to do everything at home. Oliver was doing well. His business was growing. He no longer rented a garage and bought his own premises, which was in the city limits. Who's going to tell me who has an accounting degree? They were lying in bed in the evening talking. He's not here yet, she laughed. I'm serious. I need an accountant, and I think a family contract would be just right. He turned to her. Will you hire Tom? He's been asking for a job for a long time. He decided to finish nine grades and then go to school to be a motor mechanic to help his father. Why not? Oliver wondered why he hadn't asked him himself. Then it was agreed. Everything was fine in the family now. They were standing at the line. Tom was graduating from high school. When one of the girls in a beautiful uniform read a poem, Selena suddenly felt sick. What's the matter with you? Her husband picked up on it. Probably the son. The woman didn't realize it herself. I don't think the son has anything to do with it. Oliver winked at her. You think? She knew what he meant. I'm sure. The man walked over to Tom, whispered something in his ear. He turned and showed his mom the class. What did you say to him? The wife was shocked. Nothing, let's go. He took her under his arm and they walked out of the schoolyard. Seven months later, the family heard the cries of the little princess they all adored. We should go to the woods and visit Jacob's grandfather, Oliver said, his daughter almost two years old by then. Why not, Tom agreed, because he already knew the story of what had happened to his parents. True, he had not been told it in detail, but in general terms. Okay, Selena took the baby in her arms, they left the house, got in the car, and all together they headed to the place where it had once been so painful and scary. Grandpa Jacob. Oliver entered the hut, no one answered him. Do you know where he lives in the village? His wife asked him. No, he did not say, I was only here. They went out into the yard. There wasn't much wood in the woodpile, Oliver walked inside. He pulled back the tarpaulin as he did then. The snowmobile was standing there. I think our grandfather is gone, he said as he looked at the equipment. What makes you think that? Selena didn't understand. She watched her daughter walk around and look at everything around her. The chain is practically rusted, he pointed to the piece. It was summer now, maybe he just hadn't been working on it. That was obvious. No, you didn't see how much he loved that vehicle. Fiddled with it like a child, he couldn't have let it run like that, Oliver was sure. And though they didn't know exactly where the village was, they made their way around the forest and drove to the first settlement. As soon as they said who they were looking for, they were immediately shown Jacob's house and told that he had died last summer. It's a shame we didn't visit him sooner, Celine sighed at the cemetery. It's okay, this old man will stay with me forever right here, he patted his chest on the left side. And I have. At this point, the little girl in her mom's arms cried, as if sensing her mood. That's it, time to go home. Oliver hugged the family. Yes, his wife clung to him. Tom stood looking at the cross that stood on his grandfather's grave. Can I borrow his snowmobile? He asked his father. Who knows now? The man was surprised at such eagerness. They returned to the village, to the same house. Jacob had a daughter and granddaughter staying with him. Hello, 
Tom came through the wicket door. Hello, a young girl came out to him. The boy stood looking at her and was silent. She seemed so beautiful to him. Well, ask her why you came, his father hurried him up. Ah, yes, he told her. He told her that he could repair the equipment and if necessary, return it to the family. She laughed, which made her even more beautiful. I think someone will be coming here very often, Selena whispered to her husband. I noticed too, he looked at his son. He was falling in love for the first time. They all drove home together. Tom didn't take the snowmobile. They had agreed with William that he would build it right there in the woods and she would help in any way she could. Mom, I'm gone, he left the apartment. Well, I've lived to be a bride, Selena said in the hallway. Wait, you still have fientos ahead of you, Oliver pointed at his daughter. I hope it won't happen very soon. She laughed and went to the kitchen. In the evening, the mother and father arrived. They were visiting the children often now. They helped with their granddaughter and just wanted to have some fun. Daughter, why didn't you tell us where or with whom you went? Her father asked her. What? Selena was stunned. She didn't expect that question to come up after all these years. Well, from Sam, he called me then, the man admitted. What did he say? She was really curious. Said you'd met some prisoner who'd done time for causing the death of his girlfriend. He didn't get much time. It was proved he was only vicariously liable. His father didn't look at her. That was all in the past. Selena at this point regretted not asking anyone back, then what John's fault was. Okay, no more pestering, got up, and left the room to her parents' room. But there was one silver lining to the story, if she hadn't left with him then, she never would have met Oliver, and he's the most wonderful man she's ever met.